I remember how to how to host a podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Fantasy Network. I'm, of course, Jimmy Nuts. And today we're back with the uh, 15th episode <laughs> of Chatting with Nuts, which is a whole lot of hours, if you were wondering. And uh, yeah, we're having our uh, one of our favorite guests back for the second time. And that is Dr. Philip Chase. Philip, how are you? I'm doing great, Jimmy. It is such an honor to be here. And um uh... I feel like I'm a veteran now because uh, it's it's my second time on chatting with nuts. So uh, thank you so much for inviting me back. Yeah, I mean, it was you were definitely one of the uh, most requested people I've had <laughs> for a repeat visit. Uh, and our last conversation is among one of my favorites for sure. I thought I... Uh, I, I tell everyone, I, if if you need a Malaz and sales pitch, you got to go back and watch the first episode uh, with me and you on it because that's what it was for... The majority of the podcast is you getting me hyped up for Malaz and helping me <laughs> take the uh, the leap. And uh, as you know, I I did take that leap. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm really thrilled that you're reading Malaz and and that you're liking it. Uh, so this is uh, uh, it, it's just great. You know, uh, it's such a wonderful series, and I'm I'm glad you're you're getting a lot from it. Yeah, I uh, I gotta say, I I love it, man. I I've been really impressed with it so far, and it's not as confusing as I thought it would be, but it's still confusing. Uh, but that's part of the charm. That's part of the figuring out process that keeps me coming back for more. Um, and I'm actually for everyone watching, I told Philip already, but, uh, I'm in the book five, <laughs> which is, yeah. Wow. Which is pretty crazy. This book got grim real fast, uh, going into part three. And, uh, I wasn't even supposed to read this to the end of October, but I finished house of chains and I just wanted to keep going. So I did. So um, it, it's been great. People uh, seem to really enjoy the thumbnail that I put up, which if you haven't seen the thumbnail, folks, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what rock you've been underneath. But this thumbnail has the two largest arms in the world. <laughs> well, those would be your left and your right arm, I think. That is correct. And then Philip is also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the making that thumbnail was possibly the most fun I've had on BookTube yet. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was, I, I laughed for a solid two or three minutes. I think when I saw that thumbnail. <laughs> yeah. You sent me uh, an email and you said, I love the greatest thumbnail ever. Ha 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 ha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yes. I got Philip to laugh. <laughs> it was like a ha for every minute that I laughed. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a lot of fun. So uh, that was yeah, so we've got lots of good company here. Look at all these great people. Wow. A lot of my patrons are here. I'm always happy to see them and Eddie. And uh, I saw Alan lurking. Alan is uh, Alan's a good Alan. We're going to break your record. <laughs> we're going to break your record, Alan. I'm feeling it. Alan's frothing at the mouth hearing that. He's so competitive. <laughs> and Professor Fireballs is in the house. We got AP in the chat. AP, how are you? My, I, you know, I, I, uh, I got a little intoxicated when I was in Las Vegas and I actually, well, I was on vacation and I think I, I sent AP a drunken email <laughs> just saying like, Hey man, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. <laughs> and he responded with, uh, you know, dear sober Jimmy, I assume maybe possibly hung over Jimmy. <laughs> Thank you for the kind email. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, I was in the Cosmopolitan uh, Casino and I again, I was a little on I was a little under the influence and I was just thinking about me and AP's conversation. I said, God, that was wow. great. You know, it, it was on my mind. So I sent him a little uh, drunken email and he got back to me and uh, I was shaking my head at myself the next day. <laughs> That's uh, that is an impactful conversation. And Alan says he's the least competitive person he knows, which is, you know, I actually don't think I even have a remote chance of coming even anywhere near Alan's record. Uh, so I think even <laughs> if he had like laryngitis, he probably could could outdo me any day. So I, I just there's no way I could I could do it, Alan. In all seriousness, he's but, great. Yeah. Uh, he was uh, under the weather for our Jeopardy episode. We just did book Jeopardy. If you haven't checked that out, it's on Alan's channel. I had a absolute blast. You could see my gambling problem at full tilt. I was being a degenerate, and I didn't even understand how the game worked. And I was just betting all my money uh, on Jeopardy. But Alan was sick during that recording, and uh, the yeah. fact that he got through—I mean, it was like two and a half hours. I have no idea. The guy's a machine. Um, <laughs> well, nothing can dampen the enthusiasm because I saw his uh, 
talk with Josiah Bancroft today uh, and uh, a few other of our friends. And yeah. that was, yeah, very exciting. You, you know how he feels about uh, the, uh, the uh, books of Babel. So he likes them just a little bit. Yeah, he likes them a wee bit. And I'm, I'm going to read that series myself probably next year uh, due to the enthusiasm. <laughs> and there's yeah. Mark from Slowly Red. Yeah, hey, Mark. Mark is phenomenal. So Mark, um, I, I, knew, I knew Mark's channel existed. I was subscribed, seen some of his videos. He popped in the last time me and you chatted. And then I started going through his back catalog of videos. And uh, Mark reads a lot of books that I want to get to. And I think Mark does a phenomenal job of reviewing books. Oh, he does. He's a yeah. great reviewer. Yeah, very astute reviewer. Yeah. I, I really, and he is a big fan of uh, like Prince of Nothing and R. Scott Baker. And yep. I just read book one of that, which is funny because me and you talked about it last time. We were talking about series we wanted to get to. Well, I read book one and it, and it was excellent. It was excellent. And I know, cool. uh, you know, Mark's reviewed that. So uh, that's a, this is another person that absolutely, if you're looking for people who are reviewing books that not everybody talks about, Mark's got you covered and does a really good job of articulating yeah. his thoughts, I think. So, yeah, he's done a great job with the uh, with Baker's books. In fact, he's one of the few channels I know that's actually got videos on on Baker's uh, Prince of Nothing. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to post a review hopefully in the coming weeks. I'm so far behind on my <laughs> reviews. Philip, it feels like I have an anvil on my head. <laughs> <laughs> All that's going to come squeezing right out eventually, right? I mean, I'm three reviews behind on Malazan. <laughs> so, oh, like, you know, oh. I, I got Memories of Ice House Chains. I'm going to finish Midnight Tides tomorrow. So that's three I got to do, um, which maybe we'll have a, a therapy session about that uh, here in the coming minutes. RJ, thank you so much for the five spot. RJ's always generous. And is that Avatar Lies of Locke Lamora? Is that who that is? Or am I wrong? I don't know. Let me know. I'm not sure. It's very dapper, whoever it is. Let me know. Let me know, RJ, in the chat. Alan said, I killed it at Jeopardy, dude. I just kept betting the house. <laughs> like every time, I was like, you don't need to do that. I'm like, just bet it all. Just take it off my hands. <laughs> we got Sarah Reed. Man, I'll tell you what, the MVP. Oh, hey, Sarah. Hey, Sarah. This is great. Yeah. Go for the record. Why not better than saying Royal Pepper makes a noble shroud? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man no I, I know when i'm outgunned I'm, I'm, I'm next to jimmy on the thumbnail i'm outgunned there and <laughs> it, when it comes to uh a live stream uh i am outgunned by alan any day so yeah i mean you know what though you have the sharpest mind i know i mean oh well you know when we, when we think about the two intellectual pillars of booktube it's you and ap like you guys are like i feel like you know, we say things, but they can only be validated uh, by our doctors. You know? Oh, no, no, no. You know what? <laughs> I promise you AP would agree with me here. We learn stuff all the time from our viewers and from other people's videos. Uh, so it's it's a the thing that I think keeps me sharp is that my philosophy is that every day is an opportunity to learn. So and I'm constantly learning from people. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea, Darren. Slowly read. Mark should be here at some point. You've got to. A lot of great people that uh, are, I hope will be coming on to chatting with nuts. Yeah, yeah Iskar is someone I, I need to have on as well. Yeah, Iskar Jarak, phenomenal guy, really fantastic, and of course, someone for you to uh, to you know pick his brain on all things Malazan because there's a guy who knows that series up and down. Oh, he's incredible. Yeah. And we were actually admiring his thumbnails before we went live. We were talking about how good his <laughs> we were is. laughing at his thumbnails. They're so good. Yeah. They're like subtly hilarious. Like just like, you know, showing talking about Coltane from the you know, chain of dogs. And you got like a little girl in a raincoat in the thumbnail. Just like small things like that make me laugh. <laughs> yeah. Um, reading Rainbow, uh, which is still the best name on YouTube, says, uh, I read The Broken Empire because of Mark. Said uh, Mark said so, and I'm so glad he did. If yeah. I didn't have a vendetta against Mark Lawrence, I would read it. Um, but vendetta. unfortunately, wow. unfortunately <laughs> it's like a, a feud I've created in my head. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you got to keep things spicy, Philip. You know what I mean? When you don't have the brains like me, you got you to gotta create some drama. Um, yeah. So... Huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I love Mark Lawrence's books. They're fantastic. <laughs> I've heard good things. I've heard very good things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Malazan reviews. Oh, yeah. No, no, yeah. No complications at all. Professor Fireball. Never. Yeah. That's why we talk for hours and hours about <laughs> and realize afterwards that we haven't covered even a fraction of the stuff. So, yeah. Uh, but. Hello, yeah, that, Sarah. 
that's like one of the hardest things about Malas. And so I said after book two, I said from memories I saw, I'm just doing spoilers. Right. I said, because at this point, like I might maybe do like for memories of ice, I might have like a one minute spoiler free thoughts and it's going to be, hey, this is amazing. <laughs> you should definitely read up to this point to see if it's for you or not. Uh, yeah. But the rest of it is just going to be spoilers because there's just too much. There's way too much context. And you want to get into the nitty gritty because that is where the beauty lies in Malaz, and in my opinion so far. Yeah. And I just don't think a spoiler free, like there's some series I can talk about spoiler free throughout the whole thing. And I feel pretty okay. I did the hob honestly. Um, and I was able to stay vague enough not to ruin things with people uh, or for people rather. Now with Malaz, I'm getting these spoiler reviews and I'm going to tell you what, man, my memories of ice notes. I've never taken this many notes ever. I, it, it, I think the video is going to be an hour long and I'm just like, I'm not dreading it because I don't want to do it. I'm dreading it because I, it's just so much effort and then having to, you know, and then I have four other reviews to wait on. So my question to you is and the people watching too, when it comes to spoilers, is it, what, what do you prefer? Do you prefer a person like me talking to the camera and saying all these spoilers and talking my reactions and stuff, or is it better to do that in a conversation format? Cause like, I loved our conversation. Uh, me, you and Rid had about yeah. gardens of the moon. I mean, how fun was that? Yeah. And I'm thinking, like, maybe instead of doing the review, we just do the, dis you know, a discussion over the book since yeah. it is spoiler context. What do you think? I think that's a great thought. I, th I, you know, AP and I do our talk for every single Malazan book. And what we do is we have divided it this way. I, I take the spoiler free uh, discussion on my channel and then he has the spoiler filled discussion on his channel. And it is further and further into the series, it can be a little more difficult to come up with, okay, what are we going to talk about here for the spoiler free one? <laughs> you know, but I feel like there's just, it's such a rich series and every book has yeah. so much going on. And you can talk about the themes in a way that it contains no spoilers whatsoever. And you, you can talk about, you know, you know, whatever feels inspiring to you. Yeah. Uh, it, it it's tricky oh yeah wisdom of crowds we got to talk about that too oh uh, we definitely know you read it as well so oh, um good. yeah but anyway yeah that, that's how we divide it up but i think your idea of so doing a spoiler free review on your own you could do and then have a discussion with other people with the spoilers that works out pretty well that's actually what i did with wisdom of crowds is i had uh my own review yeah, and then I had a discussion with Mike at Mike's Book Reviews on uh, on the book, and which was totally spoilers. So yeah, that's probably a good way to go. It's a good model, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I feel like for me, it's like because uh, I'm still reading a lot of other stuff too, right? Like I'm not I'm not only doing that. So I feel like with how how long those videos are, I'm like I can do one or the other. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And I and I prefer discussions. You know, I and I love this this format. I I just like going off the top of my head and having yeah. long form conversations, especially about Malazan, because there's just so many things yeah. that have went over my head that like someone like you or Rid or AP or Iskar could, you know, show me, <laughs> you know, lead me to the water, help me drink. Um, but I don't know whether or not, I don't know. I'm not sure. And someone actually said, I think it was Fassel said, or Faisal, I always uh, say it like seven different ways every time I do a stream, but <laughs> you, you could do a spoiler free for Midnight Tides for sure, since everything is new. And it's funny you say that because huh. in my notes, I looked at it and I said, you know, I'm mentioning names and events uh, that of stuff that's happened, but I'm like, this is largely spoiler free. Like, I could turn this into a spoiler free if I wanted to. I probably will make a, it'll probably be one of my mixed reviews where I do spoilers yeah. and, and spoiler free. Um, but I don't yeah, know. A good way to handle it too. I mean, it's it's tricky. You know, uh, everybody knows that spoiler-free videos get more views than spoiler-filled videos. Mm -hmm. And although I think we probably would agree that the spoiler-filled videos are, are kind of more fun to do in a way. You just you you can delve into the you know the really the nitty gritty and and who died and you know and and what yeah. happened there and favorite scenes and all that. And, you got to restrain yourself when you're doing the spoiler free stuff, but it has a function, right? I mean, people who haven't read the book want to know, do I want to read the book? And so your job kind of is to sort of do a sales job without revealing those things. Yes. So, yeah. yes, I, I like generating excitement 
and maybe possibly helping someone be able to curate their TBR. Like those are two things that I, I like to do uh, with the channel. Yeah. Yeah. And you do get that with spoiler free or even, you know, a, a split review where you do both, which I've been doing a lot more lately. And I actually really like it because uh, I don't have the pressure of feeling I need to cover every single thing <laughs> that happens in a book on the spoilers. I can kind of balance the two, which is really nice, especially yeah. with Malazan books, because they're, you know, so packed, <laughs> especially yeah. Memories of Ice, especially Memories of Ice. Oh, my goodness. Someone <laughs> uh, asked actually above. It was Mojo said, what did you think of House of Change? Did not know you were already past it. I actually really enjoyed House of Change. Uh, I started out. I was a little lukewarm on part one. And by the end of the book, part one seemed better by by the end. I actually I kind of retrospectively thought about it and said, you know, part one was actually amazing and we couldn't have been here. I love the ending. So I was like, I feel like we couldn't have got here without part one set up. So uh, really enjoyed House of Chains, uh, which yeah. is weird because I feel like I always hear that's like some of people's like least favorite uh, hmm. of the Malazan um, series. So that, that part one too, Jimmy is going to have major payoff. I later. feel like it's going to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll make a note with the million other things that should have a big payoff. By the end. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, so a lot of people are saying they prefer the conversation for spoilers, which, which is very interesting. I, I do too. I mean, it just, I love the conversations and, and you're really, by the way, you're brilliant at them. So um, you, 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 you're, you're a very good conversationalist and uh, it's, it's a gift. Um, and but I, I do think that I come away from the conversations learning the most. Um, yes. and, and there's something dynamic. It's like being in a classroom and having a seminar style class with, you know, the ideal number of people, somewhere around 12 maybe. Yeah. And you're bouncing ideas off the other and each other. And the thing is, somebody's going to say something that is going to spark something in your brain that would not have been there otherwise. And you're going to let that out. And then that's going to, it's, it's a fantastic thing to be. That's why I love discussions because they're so dynamic and you end up going places you never could have anticipated. So it's just a lot of fun. And for me, the discussions are, are really the best of, of BookTube. It's the best of what we do here. Um, just because they're also directly, you know, it's time directly spent with, with friends, with, with people who are excited about the books. And, and that's kind of, you know, that's a lot of fun too. Yeah. It's like Alan. Yeah. We've had some great, chat oh, yeah. discussions on john Gwynn's stuff uh with uh, a lot of other people like patrick and and abby and and, and uh alex and yeah i mean it's it, we've had a lot of fun with these um so i love that I, I definitely love the conversations the most yeah. i i agree i think uh and, and it seems like more viewers actually appreciate it than than i had at first thought um especially with my robin hobb ones that i did while i went through the series uh, those are some of the most rewarding um, videos I think I've done, you know, and, and I, and it's cool because yeah. it builds relationships with the people that you're conversing with. Um, you know, like our, our Gwen talks, I really look forward to those. I really love them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, so the last one is going to be on your channel, right? Yeah. It's, uh, and it's the book I remember the least from because I read it, <laughs> you know, a year ago. Uh, so I'm glad I get to mediate it because uh, I don't have to give a super specific answer. <laughs> That's how I did. So what did you think, Sarah? Uh, yeah. <laughs> think you know yeah. Yeah, yeah there was a what that happened yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah there's that it, 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 yeah it's not fair when you it's been a while for you um but yeah so that'd be yeah Rudy rainbow says i forget the details of books i just read so spoilers aren't that bad unless it's the, yeah i'll be honest <laughs> some sometimes i forget s stuff from a book and i'm ashamed <laughs> I'm just ashamed of myself. <laughs> but um, we read we read so many books. Yeah. And all of, mostly with you know, in my case, it's all fantasy, and I think pretty much you yeah. too. So and, you know, you, three books ago can be a little difficult to dredge up, you know, the, the details uh when when you you're cramming so much, you know, and, and at a at a at, let's say, you know, faster than normal rate than we would probably be reading if we weren't on on booktube. So I am very obsessive. So honestly, I might read more if I wasn't on booktube. If I didn't have to take a break to do the videos, I'm this is just how I am. Like I can't do things. Um, I shouldn't say anything. It's like I have like problem, right? But like, for instance, working out, like I really should be working out four to five times a week, but I go six times a week and I do four jujitsu classes. And wow. it's like, I don't need to do all that. It's actually a negative return on investment because I keep, I'll get hurt, right? Yeah. But I can't. I'm just, I'm a very, I'm a daily guy. Like if I, if I get into a grind, I just do things and I do things and I'll do them until I hate them. And then I'll just hate them and keep doing. 
<laughs> that doesn't sound like fun. It, it 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 sometimes it can't it isn't, but I always look back generally when I reach an accolade, whatever it might be. Well, it used to be wrestling, um, but I'll reach an accolade and I'll look back at that that you know grind or whatever people like to call it, and I'll be happy that I did those things when I didn't want to. Yeah. Um, I always tell yeah. people you'll regret not going to the gym, but you'll never regret going to the gym. Very very few times do you do this thing that that you know you need to do uh that you don't necessarily want to do and, and regret it so yeah well um, i can relate to that i mean i used to do marathons and, and half marathons and there is a highly addictive aspect to distance running let me tell you yeah yeah um, very yeah. addictive especially when you experience that runner's high mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and you just get all these little numbers and goals and you know it, and you just kind of string yourself along until oops yep I injured myself yeah so yeah I've been and you knew you should have taken that rest day you should have taken the rest day and yeah 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 i uh i when i lost uh i back in the day i lost a lot of weight um and whenever i did i i did long distance running that i would just run around my town because i lived in a small town and you could yep. you could do that and um I, I loved running. I really did. I can't really do it now. I actually am like recommended not to because of my knees, uh, which oh. is weird because you don't hear doctors usually say, Hey, don't do, don't run. <laughs> don't yeah. exercise like that. You know, yeah. usually that's when you're 60, 70, but unfortunately with my, uh, my broken down body, <laughs> they're like, just don't, don't run. <laughs> you you're better off bicycling or, or doing something else. So yeah, I would imagine the rigors of being a pro wrestler would take a toll on one's body. Yes. Yes. And I wouldn't say that I won the genetic lottery either. Uh, it's just, <laughs> just the way she goes, but, uh, yeah, all, all those miles, but I, that's funny that you were a long distance runner as well. I, I didn't do it in an official capacity, but I remember running, you know, four or five miles in the day. And, um, I started out running just to the end of my road and then it just, every day you get yep. a little bit further, man. And, and, and you start feeling that momentum. And I feel that a lot of ways the time with books, especially when you graduate to things that are a little bit more complicated, like books that you maybe wouldn't have appreciated a year ago. Yep. I yep. love feeling myself grow as a reader. And I'm so glad that I have a community like this and, and my channel and stuff that pushes me forward and makes me try new things. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good analogy, actually. Uh, physical exercise, particularly something like running and yeah. uh, reading. And, and of course, the more you do of it, the, the better you get at it and uh, the more you get out of it. And uh, I guess there's burnout too, though, with, with reading, right? And, it's true. And so you got to be careful and take care of yourself. Take care <laughs> of your brain, everybody. Yes. Yeah. It's very important. Um, Eddie asked a question a little bit ago. Eddie, I saw this. I forgot to get to it. He said, Jimmy, November 2nd release date, Tad Williams, the prequel to the Dragon Bone Chair is on your radar. It's on my radar, but I won't be reading any Ostinard until late next year. Um, I, I want to get a little bit more <laughs> under my belt as far as authors and diversity of authors, uh, instead of the same old names, but just know I, I, next year, I definitely plan on reading that along with the last King of Osnard and, what, and what's actually, uh, been released. And I saw somebody, I don't know, Philip, if you knew this, but I'm doing a reread with Alex and Liana for uh song of ice and fire. Wow. Starting Great. today, actually, it's October. By the way, happy October, everybody! Happy fall, yeah, all pumpkins and all that good stuff. Uh, but yeah, we decided we're going to do one book a month, which I think is a great balance, uh, especially with something that I've already read before. And we're going to do a live stream at the end of every month, cover the books, talk about them in depth. And I'm bringing the heat, folks. Okay, I'm bringing the heat. I am taking vigorous amounts of notes on this, and I'm heartbroken to say my whole goal for this reread was I was going to document Tyrion's arc and how I believe I've been saying this for a long time. I think Tyrion's a villain and unfortunate. Yeah. I, and I have justifications and all this other stuff. I, I wouldn't say it's like a groundbreaking thing. Like I've heard other people talk about score, but it's, it's an opinion I've held for like two years or so. And, huh. uh, alt shift X, the best, <laughs> the best YouTuber ever in fantasy. Uh, made a video that's an hour and a half long. And it's about Tyrion's arc. <laughs> so huh. I'm not going to do that video now because there's no reason to. The goat did it. So, you know, it's uh -huh. like, eh. which kind of sucks. Uh, but I'm still pumped for the reread. I, I want to make some content around it. I haven't done a tongue of uh, a song of ice and fire content on the channel, uh, even though it's my favorite series of all time. It's pretty rare to see these days because I think people just sort of um, got tired of waiting. Um, so maybe we're over the anger and all of that. And we're at the stage where 
you you can safely do some a song. I have a couple on my channel, A Song of Ice and Fire, because I've read the series a bunch of times, actually. I read uh, the first book probably f at least five or six times because I used to teach it in my fantasy novels class. Uh, ah, that was a big hit. That's awesome. Yeah. And I've read the other books, at least each one, at least twice. The, the books four and five, probably just twice. So it's a, I, it's a series. I actually read it not long before I started my channel. So, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's among my I mean, it is my favorite of all time. And the reason and I think you're right, actually, I think they're the public favor of this i think things have settled down from the show and da 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 <laughs> yeah and and at, at the end of the day it's a it's a pillar uh of the genre whether people like it or not and i think that there is a lot of people yeah. who say let's get back to basics let's go back to the books and um at least the crowd that i roll with and the 65 people here i think most of them most of my patrons all agree that there is something special with what we have we may never get the other stuff, but there is something to be said for the work that has been put in thus far. I think yeah. it has a massive impact on people in the genre and it's exciting. Like this reread is when one of the most exciting things, and this is the first, like, I mean, we're not doing it super organized, right? Like we're not saying week one, you read one through one twenty or anything like that, but just knowing a bunch of people are rereading this with me and experiencing it and feeling all these things again is, is really cool. It's really cool. It's like one of the best advantages uh, you know, of, of taking this leap and creating a channel and creating a community and getting to know other people like Alex and Leanna and yourself. And it's yeah. just like, I don't know. It's there's something about it. there's like a buzz. And people in my in my disc, my patron discord were like showing their they started yesterday. Like, I'm cheating, I'm starting early. And I was just like, Oh, that's awesome. You know, uh, for people to get fired up about a book they've read three or four times and it's been out for 20 years isn't a testament to how special it is, I think. So yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, it's good stuff. So no, I'm not a Joffrey sympathizer, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, yeah, I'm trying to catch up as as I'm rambling. Um, I don't I like Joffrey, although I think he's you know he he does his uh, his thing. He does it really well. Everybody, well, I, I've heard a few people say they like Joffrey. I'm not. I'm kind of trying to figure that out. But <clears throat> yeah, I don't know about all that. <laughs> I mean, he's a great character, but I, I don't think I can root for him. Let's see. AP was asking if I. Uh, do anything Shakespearean when I, I do a song of ice and fire, I think. So I don't, I have a feeling that you're going to tell me all about this the next time we talk. <laughs> oh, I mean, if we want to uh, come, if we want to do that, I'm in. Oh, uh, you got to have AP back. And and I'm sure he will explain this at, uh, to you. Um, it, but I, I mean, I, uh, the, the more obvious connections to me would be the, uh, the wars of the roses, obviously. And, yes. And all this stuff going on there. But but I am confident that George Martin has read his Shakespeare for sure. So. Yeah, he he definitely doesn't mind uh, borrowing certain things from uh, other authors and stuff, which I, I actually like, um, especially whenever it, it's not super uh, obvious. Stephen King does it a lot, too, and he'll mention the author's name even like in Dark Tower. He'll do something and then be like, ah, you know, that's very uh, Elmore of him. And then it's like, oh, you really did just tell us why you wrote this scene. And I love that whenever authors wear their influences on their sleeves. I do too, actually. I think it's great. I think it's great. Yeah. I, I like a good nod, you know, or tip of the hat. Yes. You know? Especially when I know the reference, it makes me feel smart. And I, I like being told I'm smart. So yeah. <laughs> I also think it's sad when you see authors try to deny the, the connection and, and say, no, yes. no, no I, I've never read or I've never heard of this, you know, and it just seems kind of silly to, to deny it. I mean, just embrace it, embrace your influences. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and people have to realize, you know, uh, uh, there is, Obviously, there's original ideas and things, but we're, we're all very impressionable people. And we're all I think uh, maybe it was with Alan or maybe it was AP. We we're talking about subjective experiences, how that impacts you. It was Alan. Actually, I was talking okay. to Alan about it and just talking about how literally, you know, even if you write something like you're going to be influenced by the people that you write. Uh, I've written a few things. One time I wrote right after I read Abercrombie. And guess what? It was all bantery dialogue you know, one liners and <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm nowhere saying I wrote as good as Abercrombie, but I'm saying I was imitating yeah. an Abercrombie type thing. And then I read Tad Williams. And when I was reading Tad Williams, I got really motivated to write and I started writing and it was very flowery. It was very atmospheric and yeah. scene setting, you know, and yeah. it's just how it is. Cause we're all human. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you're inevitably uh, as a writer, you're going to be an amalgam in some ways of all the stuff you've read and you, you're not going to be able to totally escape that ever. And yeah, the most recent stuff you've read probably is, it has the loudest voice in your head. Yeah. But I think the more you write also, 
the the more you do find your voice, um, yeah. and that's that's kind of a cool thing too. It's certain, part of the joy of writing is finding your voice, actually. Um, yeah, and, and what you do well, you know, I I know yeah. I can start something strong. I can also do dialogue very well, and then yeah. everything in between sucks. Uh, <laughs> and then you just work <laughs> on it. You just iron it out, man. You just yeah, but play to your strengths too. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, that's I mean, right. I know that I I too could never do witty banter the way Abercrombie does or Mark Lawrence or, or um, who's the lies of Lotha Morris, uh, Scott Lynch. Scott Lynch. I mean, these yeah. guys are so good at the witty banter thing. And I'm like, Oh, this, I wish I could do that. But you know what? It, it would be awful if I tried. So, well, I'm, I'm training you right now. This is actually uh this is a workshop in, uh, in witty banter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's all the show is. It, it's, it's failed attempts of me being witty. Uh, Jake, <laughs> our, our our good friend Jake Bishop, hey, Jake. says, "What books are currently in Philip's curriculum?" Oh, because you were mentioning oh. that you had a Song of Ice and Fire early. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. dying to know this. This would be awesome. Yeah, so I mean, the the course, I, I have to confess something. It's a course that did really well for years, and I had a, just a blast in that course. And the reason I started my channel was actually initially it was supposed to be an extension of that course. So it was something that I thought my students would, you know, get engaged in the channel and it would be fun. And then maybe other people would even watch and, and that sort of thing, too. So that's how I started the channel, actually. But what's happened recently at, in, in higher education, I'm, I'm very, very sorry to tell everybody, but there has been a de-emphasis on the humanities in higher education. And this is these are decisions being made by the people in suits, the administrative people and the politicians have uh, at the level certainly of where I teach, uh, and I think it's pretty pervasive. It, this is very pervasive, not just even in the United States. I think, unfortunately, this is something that is creeping uh, into other places, but it's uh, a de-emphasis. So we used to teach a lot of literature classes at my college, mm -hmm. less than half the number of courses. We, we now teach less than half the number of literature courses than we did just a few years ago because Somebody in a suit decided that uh, history, literature, philosophy are not important for people to, uh, it, it's really, yeah, so see, Alan is seeing it too at his level. It's scary, actually. It's really scary to me that they are de-emphasizing things like reading and critical thinking. And um, yeah, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm being polite, AP. <laughs> I'm being polite. Um, but it, it, it is a very, very serious and troubling trend to me. And what motivates it, you, you probably are wondering, why are the people in suits doing this? Uh, it's because they see money. They see dollar signs. That's exactly correct. And they think it's more efficient to get the customers out the door rather yeah. than to actually teach them to think. So they want to give them the piece of paper with the credentials and, and, um, and it's all just money motivated. And to me, you know, I I, uh, I feel passionately about this. I know some people might disagree with me, but there are certain realms where there are more important things in making money. Like I think uh, education should be a human investment. Uh, yeah. So, but that's you know, it's, it's an educator in a tweed jacket talking. So yeah. <laughs> well, no, I think it's a lifelong thing. Um, you know. Yeah. That that's one thing I I, I didn't realize I was even doing. You know, but you. Uh, even as an adult, like we continue, most people will continue to educate themselves one way or another, whether it's through mediums like this and YouTube or through reading or video, yeah. whatever, whatever it might be. Um, it, I feel like the de-emphasis is, I mean, first off, that's super sad. It doesn't surprise me. And yeah. I think, you know, a big part of that has to be the fact that how many times do we see the memes of like, or people just making fun of people with a philosophy degree or whatever it might be, which I think that there's a lot of value in those. Oh things. yeah. I mean, employers would say it's ironic because a lot of employers want people who can actually think critically. So it's, it's, it's sort of a, yeah. there's a disconnect there somewhere. Um, but anyway, that was a long explanation for me saying that I'm not sure I'll ever get to teach that course again uh, uh, because of the, uh, they've killed literature at my college. So, but what I, um, what I do, what I can tell you, Jake, is that I used to <laughs> include, and by the way, sometimes I will have a student do it as an independent study. So I'll get to do it that way still. Uh, but 
But for uh, just for, for you guys to hear, I used to do uh, Song of Ice and Fire, uh, just the first book, because uh, we weren't going to do just that. It would be like just that series. Well, that's a great uh, a book to do it for, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I've done Ursula Le Guin, uh, A Wizard of Ursi. I've done Tolkien, of course, um, but I've done uh, Stephen Erickson's Gardens of the Moon. Uh, I've done uh, N.K. Jemisin's, uh the first book in the Broken Earth trilogy. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, these are books that are really conducive to discussion. So, yeah, yeah I mean, those, those are the kinds of fantasy I like to try to include. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I've done a bunch more that I, I can't think of off the top of my head. We did The Name of the Wind. That was very popular. Um, we've done uh, The Poppy War, the first book. Uh, so I've done a lot of – It's just it was a su very successful course in terms of the student engagement and, and what I got out of it and just – to me, what reading is, is all about, but but now I have I have a booktube at least. So uh, you know this is where, uh, frankly, because people are here voluntarily, right? I mean, everybody wants to be here. Who's here? And it's just a lot yeah, of fun. seventy people on a Friday. You know, yeah, that's yeah, that, that's on pretty... a Friday night. This is where it's happening, man. So, uh, I mean, this is the best bookish podcast on the platform, but you know, yeah. not to toot my own horn. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. It is. It is. It's okay. You can say it. I know. I mean, I am proud. Uh, I am very proud, not because I do anything that's uh, overtly special, but the fact that I have all these marvelous people showing up uh, and, and we're talking about these things. And, you know, we all see this in a different way, uh, whether it be, you know, at you at college or, you know, me talking to my friends who went and got degrees in literature, in English, and then I see them say, you know, I, I, there's nothing I can do with it. And then for some reason, we like demonize that in a way rather, rather than looking and saying, well, why isn't there anything to do with these things? Yeah. Um, you know, I think Scott said here, uh, he has a degree in philosophy, feels he uses it daily in work and play. Yeah, exactly that, right. Yeah, yeah, that experience is invaluable. And there's also something to be said about the arts and the fact that I think they're very social. And like you said, the best books and the books that you would choose would, would be discussion. And through that, you learn how to talk to people and yeah. you learn how a lot of times you can learn empathy and, and what makes people tick. And oh, yeah. I have had more success in my life because I've known how to talk to people mm -hmm. than ever how smart I was. I'm not that smart. I'm really not. I pay attention to little details and I try to hook onto those, but I get more out of my personal skills that I learned in those so-called, you know, electives. Uh, that than any of the other main course stuff. And it's yeah. just, it's just a shame. And I think Alan said earlier, you know, it's like, if it doesn't result in a direct job, then it's, it's getting cut. Right. And right. I just, that's such a sad, sad way to go. It reminds me, you know what it is. All right. I'll tell you who it is. It's the people who say, Oh, I don't read fiction. They're running the world folks. I'm afraid. So yeah. It's time to call the banners. I'm done with this. <laughs> Fiction readers rise up. We need more CEOs who read A Song of Ice and Fire. We need more CEOs who read Lord of the Rings. We need more people who are yeah. reading, you know, Jade City or whatever else is, uh, you know, up and coming. Uh, it's these nonfiction readers. I blame all of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, it, it is something. And I just saw a bumper sticker today. Uh, Not all who wander are lost. Um, and I was like, yeah, you know, Let's it was go. In, the, in the parking lot where I play tennis. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed teaching the name of the wind because the students loved it. They absolutely oh, I loved imagine. It. Yeah. So you were able to include so many great fans. Yeah, man. I mean, the yeah. fact that you were able to, in a, you know, educational setting, be able to bring those in and bring those up and expose yeah. people to that is, is, I mean, that's an incredible, uh, thing to do. <laughs> Especially I love saying heckle, Philip, I have to go. You didn't heckle enough, Professor Fireballs, but you are excused. So. Yes. Have a great night. Sweet dreams. <laughs> that let me tell you what folks ap was on a few few episodes ago and we cut it off at like three and a half hours or something we talked for another three or four hours i think it was <laughs> 7 a.m when he went to bed uh the man's a legend and he's one of the smartest people i've ever spoke to and very very yep. um caring and, and a good dude and yep. made me feel welcome and that's the thing about you and ap i never feel like uh you know because a lot of time academics get uh, a snob label and I've yeah. never felt that with you or AP. I really haven't. I think a lot of it is attitude. Um, I'll tell you a little story. I had a colleague once who, um, nice guy. I know I liked him a lot. He was just a nice fellow to talk to as a colleague, but he did not like his students uh, very much. And he was constantly complaining about his students. And, 
you know, he'd been there for a long time. He was like a senior guy when I was just a new guy. Uh, so it was, you know, a while back. And he was always complaining about students, though. And he told me one time the story, you know, I've been giving the same quiz for 30 years now. And it used to be that students would get A's on it. But now they all fail. It's like they all just got dumb or something, you know. And, <laughs> and I'm thinking, you've been giving the same quiz for 30 years? what's wrong with you? You know, uh, because I, I just think you, it's a lot of it, like I say, is about attitude. If, if you are coming to work and thinking, what am I going to learn from my students today? Right. I think you're going to have a much better time than you are going to be if you're stuck in your rut and you're trying to, you know, you think of yourself as this fount of wisdom and all of this stuff is going to come out and the students are going to write it down and mm -hmm. they're going to memorize it. And, I don't think that's real learning. That's what uh, that's what is known as bulimic learning, where you have students wow. who just take the stuff in and vomit it out it on a test, yeah. and then they forget it, yeah. right? So I prefer, if, if I can, I try, I strive to do a more transformative kind of learning where people are in, engaging in, in a way that they want to be there, they want to learn this stuff. And, and so it's... Uh, I, and I think to do it that way, it requires a bit of humility too. Uh, so I think empathy and humility go a long way if you're if you're going to be a teacher of any kind. Uh, yeah, yeah, I th I think that's a, a a good point. Yeah, I don't know if giving the same quiz for thirty years is uh, the right approach to that, right? Because uh, as a society, we learn differently now, right? Um, and oh, I saw this in the wrestling industry, and I know this is kind of off uh, off the beaten path here, but uh, hear me out. Back in the day, you could you could cut an angle in wrestling and run for nine months with that angle, and you could have a thirty minute match every single time that the dudes were on TV, and it would sell. And you cut some promos, and promos would be five or ten minutes. And even in the early two thousands, a lot of wrestling promos would be the first fifteen minutes of an episode of Monday Night Raw or something. Uh, and in the wrestling industry, I saw the micrization of it. It was like okay. You used to give like 10 to 15 a match and now it's all right. You got five to eight minutes and you got to still tell the story. You still got to get over the angle of the story wow. that you're trying to tell. Wow. But we don't care about the in between, which is the real like skill of wrestling huh. um, promos. You know, they cut it that you got one minute. You do one minute promo. You got 60 seconds. Sell the pay-per-view. Boom. And, you know, everything is, you know, and, and I'm not trying to, uh, you know, crap on the younger generation or anything like that. This is how society <laughs> has. This is just what it is. But like, you know, TikTok, you know, we got 10 seconds, you know, uh, and YouTube videos. Even people say, oh, that your videos are too long. You know, yeah. like our buddy Jake, I uh, mean, his videos are like 45 minutes. And I, I love that. I, I enjoy that. I actually enjoy the, the longer videos. Yeah. Um, but people, you know, they want it shorter. Hey, could you cut this down? Could you cut it down? I, I have so many things I got to get done today and I want it to be 30 seconds. Can you just pitch it to me in 30 seconds? And I think that that's kind of how everything is going, even education, right? Like, so like, and we have to respond to that. So what I guess what I'm getting at here is like the quiz wouldn't work over the same 30 years of the approach to teaching a class is because now we have to capture attentions in a, a you know, a micro uh, yeah. rather than the macro as it used to be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and I don't know. Are classes shorter nowadays? Is that something that you've noticed, or? Uh, well, they haven't gone there yet. Uh, yeah. I mean, there, there are there are certain minimum requirements that, uh, but but there is, yeah. I mean, there's an emphasis on on uh, varying things during the class time uh, and that sort of thing, which isn't a bad idea. But um, it, it it is a challenge to keep the attention of the students because the, the attention spans and I hope I don't sound too too old when I say this, but um, it, you know screens have been um, contributing to the reduction in attention span in, in people in general, not just young people, but just yeah. people. Um, so uh, so yeah, I mean if they're used to that immediate immediate adrenaline burst from you know click on this like that you know all that and it, it can seem like a lecture is is a uh, is a really tough thing to get through without whipping out the phone and checking your facebook or your uh, instagram or whatever it is you know so but but yeah i don't know um it, it it's a challenge for sure um yeah. but i that's that's the thing i, I one of the things i i love about booktube is that it offers this possibility for long-term format you know yeah. discussions and people who make videos that are 45 minutes long and and all that I mean, it you can do 
most of us can can accomplish more, get more across in 45 minutes than we can in, in eight or 10, right? So uh, I, I love that uh, possibility, not that it, you have to do that, but I just love that there's a possibility for thoroughness um, on YouTube. You don't have that in a lot of other social media, right? I mean, it's true. as far as I understand, like, you know, Twitter is very short and sweet. Instagram is short and sweet. All this stuff is, you know, emphasis is on quick, 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 because we've got to get to the next thing. Whereas I feel like BookTube gives us a, a, a longer range, so to speak. So I like that. But. Yeah, I think that that, um, I think that is true. And I think that's one of the things that's special about BookTube is it can be whatever you want it to be. Yeah. Um, you know, AP doesn't do reviews. AP, uh, you know, he, he and that's fine. He doesn't want to do those things. And AP, even, you know, he even told me, he's like, I know that that might not get as many views as other things, but this is what I want to do. And the people who do come and watch these things yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Um, now, it depends on your motivations, right? Uh, if you want to be the next, you know, big booktuber, you want to be, you know, a Daniel Green size thing, there are concessions you will have to make to reach oh, yeah. out. And I'm not hating on that at all. No, no. I mean, he does it for a living, right? So exactly. I mean, he, he has to, if he makes a video that flops, that's his bottom line. So yes. And yeah. also there's a limit on how big you can get only reviewing fantasy and sci-fi books. So you're going to mix in the manga or manga, however you say it, uh, you know, you're going to branch out into movies or whatever. And, and yeah. more power to people who want to do that. You can make this a commodity, but yeah. I think the, where the beauty of it is, is whenever you just do what you want to do. Right. And I right. always has have said, I'll stop doing this whenever I say things like, oh, I really want to review this book. But no, I, you know, I I'm afraid no one's going to watch it. Yeah, I don't really care. Um, now, it, it would be I would be a liar if I said that I didn't love when a video does well. It's just a human thing. You see that bigger number and you go, that's great. You know, that's that's exactly what I wanted from that. Um, but there are a lot of books I've read my channel. My trouble with peace review. Uh, until recently because of the third book coming out dude it did terrible it's one of my best reviews now i have a mustache and i think that is why most people didn't like it uh, <laughs> but you know i don't i didn't regret that i didn't say oh you know i wasn't upset about it and i you know what i mean and i didn't change anything i just kept doing what i'm doing and i i think that as long as you continue to do that you stay doing what you want to do and you're not yeah. worried about making it a commodity which is also okay uh, yeah. You will just find your niche. You know, I have found my people like all of you watching. You're my people. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's just like really cool and really special. So BookTube is nice in that fact that where we don't have to sacrifice anything we don't want to. Yeah. Uh, whether it be quantity or quality or, or whatever else. Um, it's, yeah. it's very much whatever you want to make it. You get a blank page and then you just go. And sometimes you don't even know what you're doing. <laughs> when I yeah. started, dude, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i just uh, i was Amen yelling at the camera <laughs> yeah oh that's true for all of us my first videos are so so awkward and so bad um so but but you're so right jimmy i, I completely agree with everything you said about you know this this is the thing we do because we love it we're here for the books we're here for the community and you're absolutely right. I mean, if you get lost in the numbers and, oh, I got to grow my channel, I'm, you know, nothing wrong with that. If that's what you, your vision is, you want to do this for a living and, and, and all that, then you do have to pay attention to the mysterious algorithms. And yes. you, you do have to, uh, you know, don't do videos that you think are going to flop, even if it's on a book you really want to read. Like I, I started doing, I'm trying to do more um, self-published authors on my channel. So yeah. I'm trying to do one a month and I've been doing that for the last three or four months. So they don't get a ton of views. Uh, and they, they, I do, uh, usually I try to do a review and if the author wants to, uh, we'll do um, an interview, a discussion on, on the book as well. So I'll do both. They're not anywhere near my most watched videos, but I don't care because I learn a lot from these people and I'm hoping, always hoping to discover the next great fantasy, you know? And so it, it's something I do because I love it. And I, I think it's... Um, it's great to uh, include this, you know, in this wonderful community to, to get the word out about these authors who have no means by them, you know, they don't have the publishing industry behind them. So, uh, so that's something I do because I want to, and you, we all do that, you know, and you don't think all the time, Oh, I got to grow the channel. You know, I got to, you know, yeah. I, at least I don't think about that. And I, um, I'll be honest. I I'm, if this is as big as it ever gets, I'm fine with it, man. 
Uh, yeah. I'm, pr I'm proud of this. Uh, yeah. I look forward to these these conversations so much. <laughs> like I love it, and people show up, which is amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it's 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 interesting. Uh, I I don't. I think me and you are very similar in the fact that we don't worry too much about the algorithm. We don't worry too much about. I don't even know what it how it works or what it is, and I I, I my <laughs> mind goes numb when I look at numbers anyway. So oh, thank you, Alan. Yeah, I know you do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So actually, I love the fact that you brought up self-publish because it was actually something I wanted to ask you about. Because uh, yeah. I know that I know that you that you I think you even mentioned it last time. It was one of your goals is to read more of that. Um, what has been your experience with self-published authors? Like, what what are the people missing? Is there any misconceptions with what self-published is? And would you say the quality on an average is that of traditionally published? Um. That was a okay. lot of questions. I'm sorry. So, no, 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 no. They're, they're excellent questions. I'm just thinking about how to answer them um, in the most honest way. So as far as quality goes, uh, oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, as far as quality goes, I think the self-published author is at a slight disadvantage. Um, I don't want to, you know, disparage the publishing industry in any way whatsoever. I think that there are a lot of great people who work in publishing who sure. are who are there to put out great books and the public industry, as we all know, has been under tremendous, tremendous pressure um, be because of competition from various realms. We don't need to get into that too much, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. See, there you go. That's cool. That That's another function of the bigger channels too, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's there's a place for all of us. We all serve a good purpose, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I watched a ton of his stuff earlier. Um, that, that's how I got into. Yeah. Book too, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, I when I started, I was like, I think I've said this before, but I, I was like, you know, I bet nobody's doing because I didn't watch BookTube or I watched YouTube for tennis. That was it, and uh, so I, I thought nobody's probably doing fantasy on uh, a YouTube channel. Let me try that, and then I go in there and there's Daniel Green. So yeah, and he was doing a good job. He's doing a great job, obviously. But anyway, back to the whatever we were talking about. Oh, no, you're talking uh, about self publishing. Yeah, yeah. So, um. The self-published authors are disadvantage, at a disadvantage because they don't have an editor uh, unless they pay somebody. And they don't have, obviously, the marketing team and all that. But just in terms of the quality of writing, what I've noticed with a lot of the self-published books is they could use a, a copy editor. Uh, they, they could use a copy editor to weed out the little things, the commas and the apostrophes and the, you know the misspellings and all that. Um, so you you have to be okay when you read a self-published author. What I've noticed so far with is, is with a larger number of just sentence level errors and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, they can have incredibly fresh, fantastic ideas, and they can you know bring new stuff to the genre that just isn't going to get out there in any other way. So uh, I found that to be the case in the self-published books that I've read so far. Uh, you know, Nicholas Lietzow did uh, Dreams of the Dying, and uh, this was a book that dealt head on with the theme of depression. Yeah, I got it over here. I'm not sure that uh, a, a, a major publisher would take that on. Um, so I, I was so glad to read that book. And I think anybody who wants to understand depression would, would and, and likes fantasy, um you know, that would be a, a, a good thing to consider. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's so I love that there are self-published authors out there. And, and, and the quality is because they haven't been through the, as rigorous an editing process, the quality is a little more rough than you would find in, for the most part. Um, then again, there are books that are published by major publishers that are, you know, not so good uh, or missing pages yeah or missing pages sometimes even yeah that happens to people <laughs> um, so yeah it is uh it's a thing that um i want to be more and more in support of because i do think that more and more we're going to have more and more great authors going the self-published route I, I think a good example is uh josiah bancroft so alan and, and company, a great example they were talking about how he was self-published first um and would he have what would have happened if he had given up and if he said well nobody in publishing wants me so i guess i'll just you know throw in the towel uh good thing for self-publishing because we wouldn't have the books of babel otherwise that's right so, and look how many people love it 
I mean, it's, yeah. it's exploded. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and they have to be selling well as well because uh, there's been a yeah. huge push from their, uh, their marketing team for it as yeah. well. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think that you bring up a really good point and it's the fact that what gets published and this is just reality. Um, this right. is just the world we live in. Everything, you know, we're talking about commodity, all this stuff. <laughs> when George Martin got his TV deal and everything's blowing up, you saw a lot of grim, bleak, low fantasy. Now, now the big seller that's active is Brandon Sanderson. So you're going to see a lot of hard magic systems. You're going to see, uh, you know, high <laughs> fantasy and things like that. Yeah. So I, there are trends and there are things they're specifically looking for. Uh, and again, I hate to relate it back to wrestling, but in wrestling, there were times where I had no chance of ever getting signed by WWE because they were looking for six foot six, 240 pounds. Like literally they had a cutoff for weight that you had to be a certain height and a certain weight uh, or a certain weight. Um, you're not and six foot six, Jimmy. I am not. I'm six one, unfortunately. And oh, I only weighed I'm like six one. <laughs> I, was, I was six one and I was like two fifteen. So they, they were like, you're too small, you know. Uh, but then that changed because they had a couple guys who became stars that were smaller. And they said, okay, we're gonna change requirements. Same thing with books. Um, and there are a lot of times where the trends will change an author's story. And I think that self-publish offers a really cool opportunity for them to explore what they truly set out to do. Uh -huh. Now, like you said, with the copy editor and stuff, there might be some mistakes, yada, yada, yada. But Sort of right. Kaigen comes to my mind. Sort of Kaigen is very unique, in my opinion. Like, yes, there's yeah. a, there are influences from like Avatar, maybe, and some other stuff. But like largely its own thing. And there's even a section of that book that is so out of left field yeah maybe it should have been edited out <laughs> you could maybe argue <laughs> um but it isn't and i actually kind of love that section uh not because it is the best thing ever written but because it's just so wacky uh you know it's something that you you wouldn't see you know in a traditionally yep. published book and i really like that yep yeah that's a big advantage for the self-published authors yes you you don't get the guidance you don't get the editing but you get to put out your vision without interference. Yes. You, you get to, you know, if, if you want to have, you know, uh, I don't know, like flying uh, guinea pigs in your <laughs> fantasy, you can have them. Um, so, you know, that's the thing. You get creative freedom. And I think that's something that is, is it's, you know, worth considering for somebody who's thinking, do I want to go traditional publishing or do I want to try um, the, uh, self-publishing. Well, one big advantage of self-publishing is you get to your, your own creative freedom, which is a big deal, I think. So, and, you know, we're talking about our creative freedom in booktube and how we make our own communities. Let's, let, let's, let's be honest. I mean, that's what authors are going to start doing. Uh, Brandon Sanderson is setting, like he has his team. What is it? Dragon Mount or, or what Or no, that's a uh, wheel of time. Uh, Whatever his publishing, I, I got stuff from, I got the anniversary edition up there, but whatever. His team is phenomenal. And he's I'm doing sure. a, he's, yeah, he's doing a YouTube channel. He's connected with his audience. Like he's changing yeah. the way authors approach their stories and their, and their audiences. Yep. Smart guy. It yeah. makes sense to me that the publishers will start having to really pull out money to these people because yeah, you get a diehard, like Brandon Sanderson could leave tour right now and sell just as many as uh, many books I, I really believe that well and or, he would make he would make more money per book too that's exactly what i'm saying i think there's money on the table and that's kind of the community like we're all in like these little like micro communities right and yeah. we get into our own little niches and then we get evangelical about it almost like we want to share things out right like we get fired up i mean alan's a great example of that alan gets fired up about sendlin ascends and he causes <laughs> you know he caused a shortage for um uh, oh yeah, for uh, Daniel Abraham's the Long Price Quartet. Yes, I I, I, I kept wanting to say Dagger and Coin, but yeah, Long Price Quartet's out of stock because Alan. And it's like I bet Daniel Abraham was like, "What in the world? They're going to reprint my book now?" You know. So I wonder in the wow. future if we'll see like these independent authors be able to actually generate more income where it's a more viable strategy. Daniel Green's an example. Yeah. Oh, I think he, I admire Daniel Green for that. I know I didn't quite understand why people were giving him a hard time for talking about his own book on his channel i thought why not you know i mean and i absolutely kudos to the guy you know for um for building his platform and and i think if we're going to be honest here let's be honest everybody most of us who are in booktube want to write 
and and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so I, yeah. I personally cannot, I don't have a problem with him uh, promoting his own book. Uh, and I think that is, like you said, like, okay, so Brandon Sanderson established himself in the publishing industry first, but he's using YouTube very cleverly as a, as a platform. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think the combination is um, more and more today, whether you're self-published or if you're uh, in the industry, you have to be your own marketer uh, in addition to whatever, you know, the, the publishing industry puts behind you. You gotta, you gotta be out there. You gotta hustle. You gotta be able to talk to people. You, it's not enough to sit in your uh, ivory tower by the fireplace and write, get, write, write great books anymore. You, you have to be out there hustling. So um, yeah, it's, it, I think you're right, Jimmy. Uh, it's, it's the way it's going. Yeah. Yeah. And I like what Scotty said, uh, you know, Sando was initially encouraged to write like Germ. but you're talking about trends, you know, in, in talking about this stuff and uh -huh. that shows you, I mean, imagine, I don't, I don't want think that, that. would have worked very well. Cause that he's, <laughs> I don't think Sanderson is, is, um, that's not his thing. He, what he does is really well to me is, um, it's not as, as, uh, uh, gritty, let's say as George R. R. Martin. And yes. it would be terrible if he tried to do that. What he does is is a little more uh, family friendly, I guess, is what I want to say. Yeah, um, and, and Brandon actually even said that when he, he actually didn't finish Game of Thrones. Uh, he said, it's a great book. He's just like, I just don't mesh with that. And that's great. I don't want yeah. I don't want authors who have a passion and a story to tell to, to trying to be somebody else. I just don't want that. So I think in the future, we're going to have a really interesting uh, complex. And, and honestly, Daniel Green is a really good example because he went his yeah. own way and he was able to have all of his freedom. He went out and got the narrators he wanted for his book. And obviously yeah. he has connections through BookTube and stuff, which really helps. And yep. I don't blame him at all. Whether I didn't read his book, uh, I, I, I've i seen both. I haven't read it yet either. I, I might read it someday. I'm open to it. Maybe. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I got to get to, you know, yeah. um, but you know, whether it, I don't, I'm, this is not a conversation about his quality. I don't care about any of that. Right. Um, but what I do respect is someone putting themselves out there. And I do think that what we saw from him is what's going to be the trend, not from booktubers, but from authors building a community online, yeah. Yeah, selling yeah. within that community, getting feedback, going back to the drawing yeah. board. And then you're going to watch, you know, that author, that you are so tightly knit to in the community grow. Brandon Sanderson's grown. Brandon, San yeah. Brandon Sanderson is so much of a better writer than he was 10 years ago. I'm and sure. now you're getting to watch it in real time while getting videos from him weekly. I mean, that's just incredible. It's really cool. And if an author can become a booktuber, why can't a booktuber become an author? Yeah, so, why not? Well, I will say the negative reaction that Daniel Green got made me very apprehensive because uh, you're right. I mean, I know you're a writer and I'm going to ask you a little bit about that in a second. And, and I, and I, I want to write. Uh, I don't know if I want to do it professionally. I don't know if I want to release it. Uh, I don't know if I have the, <laughs> I don't know if I have the skin, uh, thickest skin for that. Oh, uh, especially that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I've dealt with a lot of criticism in my life, especially with wrestling. Uh, you know, that, that was part of the business, but for something that comes from your own mind and it's on your own merits, uh, there's something uh, kind of cr hard about that. You know what I mean? Uh, to, to accept that kind of criticism, I have to be in the right uh, mind space. Yeah. But I saw the flash uh, flack he got for using his platform to push his book. And I just thought that was so odd. Yeah. I thought that was odd too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you have to like you, you it, and you yeah. worked for that platform. So yeah. it would be different if everyone came to your channel for books and then you switched it and you became a, uh, I don't know, working on cars or something. You know what I mean? Of course, that would be a bait and switch. Uh, but it's not that far fetched to believe that someone with a booktube channel would want to release <laughs> a book. You know what I mean? I promise you that the majority of booktubers are also aspiring writers. I promise you, the majority of us. Um, yes. I'm pretty confident in that prediction. So. Um, not all. I mean, there are some who are here just because they, they want to read and, and talk about books and stuff. But uh, I think it, and I don't I don't have a problem with that. I think that's a uh, the, the two things go together really well. So um, and you, you learn a lot about uh, each realm from the other one. So um, it's it, it's a nice confluence of interests. Yeah, I uh, I definitely think i need to finish reading a lot more series before i sit down and really give it a go i actually was talking to my friend Hawk the other day and i said yeah. i like there's a there's actually a certain list and i don't know it like off the top of my head but there's a certain list of series that i want to finish 
and then I want to see what I can come up with. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's, that's a good, uh, that's good advice for people who want to write. Also read outside of fantasy. Yes. Read a lot of just, you know, if, if you're curious about how the brain works, read that. If you're curious about the cosmos, read about it. You know? yeah. That stuff will work its way into your fantasy and will make it unique in, in, in some respects. So I think that's uh, it's very important to read a lot, read in the genre, read outside the genre, read fiction, read nonfiction, read, read, read. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Philip, you're working on a trilogy. Is that right? Is it a trilogy or a book or? Yeah. Uh, the books at home. Yeah. I have been working on a trilogy for the last 16 years. Uh, <laughs> wow. so longer than some of the people, uh, who are on the chat have been alive probably. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I've been working on a trilogy. I actually have a, a standalone sequel written as well. Um, but the, uh, the trilogy is a, uh, thing that I've been doing a long time and I had, I feel like I've learned a lot while I've been doing it and I feel like it's ready. Um, I'm trying to go the traditional route. I, I do have an agent, um, which is a huge process. Is it AP? AP. Okay. So I actually, there are APs. There's an AP story in here too. I, I did actually show my AP is if you, for those of you who don't know, I think most of you do. AP is an advanced reader for Steven Erickson and Ian S. Lamont, and he's an editor, and he's he's done a lot of – he's a brilliant, brilliant editor. Uh, he's absolutely brilliant, and he won't talk about this stuff because he can't. Uh, that's part of the professional relationship. He doesn't talk about – you know, advice he gives to people. He doesn't talk about specific stuff at all, but uh, he, uh, he is a brilliant editor. And I did, I did have him read over my, my first book and he has read it. And uh, he gave me some just really insightful suggestions. Um, so, and I, I did incorporate them into the book and edited it. And I feel like it's uh, a, an even better book now because of that. Um, so, and I, I've had my agent as well was a really helpful um, pair, has a good pair of eyes. So he's, my agent is, is, was really helpful in the process of, uh, of writing. And he's very established in the publishing industry. He's at a, one of the major ag agencies. Uh, it's called the writer's house. And uh, he, uh, he does, um, he's got some pretty big books uh, actually that he's been the agent for uh, that people would have heard of. Uh, but yeah. So, wow. so where are you in the process? So the process now is just, can he find a publisher for me? Mm -hmm. That's it. I mean, that's, you know, the bottom line now. And um, it's a, uh, it's a, it's like it's like there are all these hurdles. If you want to go traditional publishing, the first hurdle is, of course, you have to write a book. <laughs> that seems to be hard. That's a big hurdle. That that's a. I read a good book, and I would I would just say, edit until you don't think you can edit ever again, and just show it to people. Show it to people you think are are you know have a good eye who who read that sort of stuff. Show it to lots of people. Don't be shy and be humble. When people tell you something doesn't work, listen, because a lot of times you're attached to your writing and it hurts when people criticize your writing, but you're asking them to read it to help you make it better. So you have to be uh, okay with gutting parts of your book that you thought were just great. But and being vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You have to be okay with that. You be, be humble. So once you've finally done all that, once you, you've spent years writing a great book, then you got to find an, edit, uh, a, an agent. And that's a huge process. That's the next big hurdle. And that's where you've got to send out query letters. And there's a whole art to writing a query letter. It is harder than writing a book in some way. <laughs> so you, you send out query letters and you, you do a lot of research because you've got to find an agent who would be interested in the kind of book that you're writing. So look up your favorite authors. If you're writing that kind of book and find out who the agents are and query those agents um so and it's really really you got to invest a ton of time in, in doing this right um, yeah. and so you're going to spend that you're going to send out 100 query letters and you're going to get most of them are going to ignore you a few are going to send you uh a, a kind of a just a you know a, a blanket you know response a form you know, yeah. it says, thank you for your blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, it's, it's a no. Um, <laughs> and then you might get, you might get a couple of say, this sounds really interesting, but you know, it's more personalized, but 
uh, I don't think so right now, you know, or something like that. And then you'll, if you're really, really lucky, you're going to get somebody who's going to come on board and is going to help you make the book. Okay. You thought you wrote a great book. Well, if you have a good agent, your agent is going to kick your butt and is going to make you go over it again and again. And yeah. until it's really, really ready. And then the agent is going to basically shop it around and uh, they're going to try to find a publisher for you. And, and that's the next hurdle, by the way. So you got the, the next hurdle is the agent get, getting you the publisher. And then even then, if you get a publisher and you work with an editor, by the way, now you've got to do it all over again. You've got to revise your book again because the editor at the publishing house is going to want to make changes. Uh, so you, you yeah. have to have a ton of humility here. So then you got to do all that. And then they publish your book. Yay. Well, guess what? There's another big hurdle. So there's a, a, a dirty secret, maybe not a very well-kept secret in the publishing industry, but they will publish, you know, let's say they publish 20 books in a year. They will eat, uh, early on find out, okay, which two or three books are doing well. And then they're going to put everything behind those two or three books. Yeah. And the other 18 are going to disappear forever because they aren't going to market them. So you might pass all those hurdles and you get to the point where you have a book, yay, and a publisher has published it, a real publisher, but nobody buys it because nobody ever hears about it. So that's the other hurdle you have to get by. Yeah, it's, it's it sounds kind of depressing. You have to really, really, really want to do this. Yeah, I mean, that's why you always see people working on something like you, you know, for multiple and multiple years and, and grinding yeah. that grindstone and keep it going back to the drawing board and getting crushed and getting back up. Yep. Uh, I mean, yeah, I can relate to that in a lot of ways with stuff I've done in my life as well. And, and just being able to take the punches and roll with them and, and deciphering good and bad feedback and, and then going from there. Um, Nick, thank you for this five spot. Nick says, Jimmy, I really enjoy your content. Thank you for having Philip as a guest. And Philip, I'd love to read your books and support you. I think we all would. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Her- well, I, you know, I'm trying this traditional publishing route. And if it doesn't work out, I will eventually self publish. So. And and I think you would do well with that. I, I definitely do. We'll see. Um, yeah. Br- Brent brought this up, and and actually, this is an author I was going to bring up as well. I haven't read any of his books, but I know he's ha- finding great success. And uh, he says, really yeah. enjoy talking to Christopher Rocchio in Discord, not only about his books, which are great, but he has really given some insight, some of the publishing insight oh, baseball that I find fascinating. Yeah, yeah, he seems like a really smart guy. I haven't read his books yet, but he seems like a really smart guy. Yeah. Yes, and apparently we should all. I, I actually, Sun Eater is number one or two in my priorities for the next year. So wow, I'm uh, I'm very excited about that, and I I know it has a lot of nods to doom we were talking about influences on the sleeve and everyone says that he is not afraid <laughs> to, to show you know his influence from frank herbert and stuff I actually was reading dune for the first time a few weeks back and i went to the read along that tor did uh because i didn't understand a section and i wanted to get more insight and i love those read alongs they do on tour and in the comment section in 2014 chris Faracchio is in there and i'm like that's the sun eater guy you know that was kind of uh-huh. cool uh, back to your book though Okay. Yeah. What, what do you think is the cutoff where you say I've had enough, I'm going to go into self-publishing and have you done any inquiry into what that's going to look like? Not yet. Yeah. I'm, I'm still hoping my agent will, will, you know, manage to find a, a, a uh, an editor at a publishing house. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I haven't decided yet. What's the cutoff um, where I will say, okay, we gave it a try. Let me try self-publishing now. And I would obviously have to do a lot of research to do that. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I worked so hard on the books and, um, yeah, I don't know how long it took John Gwynn. Um, I think it was 15 years. Was it really? Okay. It was 10 or 15. It, it, it was quite long. Huh? Huh? Yeah. So I don't know, um, when I would say, okay, let's go try self-publishing. Um, but I would, I would, I wouldn't just let them disappear, uh, because I put right. so much, I put my heart and soul into those books and I think they're a great story. I, I'm oh, yeah, a, little man. Biased, a little biased there, but I think they're uh, uh, a great story. And um, hopefully people will agree whenever they do come out. Two legends. <laughs> yeah, Jay, man, carry thing, uh, which, man, I love this guy. He said two legends come together. Oh, he's, oh, he's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> of mental and physical power. Who is stronger? Who will win? The tension is unbearable. Two of the best book tubers go into a live stream. Only one will return next time <laughs> on Dragon Ball Z. 
See, I think Jimmy, we should have done this in, in a like a wrestling mat. I almost, I almost wore a tank top, but uh, as, contrary to the thumbnail, uh, might make you believe I'm actually extraordinarily um, shy. <laughs> like I, I still generally wear a t-shirt in the pool. Like I, I'm, I'm that guy. Really? Um, yes, yeah. yes, very much so. The only time I've ever felt comfortable being like shirtless was in a wrestling ring because it was part of the job, so I had to do it. Um, huh. But. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, man, I think you should, you know, don't keep those things tucked away. And, and I'm glad yeah. that you've decided not to do that because I think one of the most valuable things that you can do as a human being and in this experience of life and in the cosmos and whatever um, is to leave something behind. And, and we do that a lot of ways with the people that we interact with on a daily basis. But we also leave that behind yeah. in the things that we, uh, you know, people will call work. But, you know, pieces of art that, that we leave that are pieces of us and how we view this crazy uh, thing that's existence and, and and whatnot. I just watched Midnight Mass on Netflix and it was by Flanagan, who uh, did Bly Manor and uh, The Haunting of Hell. He's he's just nailing it. And I thought that that really captured uh, like it, it went into a lot of themes about religion and, and, and all these other things. But huh. I thought it did a wonderful job of explaining like death and <laughs> i know this sounds weird but like uh death and then what happens after and what we pass on and in a lot of ways you know you're immortalized when you put the pen to the paper and you decide to share it uh and that is the payoff for obviously there could be monetary gain but it, there is something to be said about passing that on and then someone in 30 years picking up you know uh philip chase's book of the dragon or you know that's your placeholder title now <laughs> it, <laughs> you, you know in 30 years someone reads what you said yeah. and it resonates with them and, and you know maybe maybe they carry that on and then they show that to their you know their children or whatever and yeah. uh you know I, I always think about that stuff especially with like tolkien and germ and ursula Le Guin and these people who have just changed the world oh so yeah i so agree with you yeah, yeah and, and you know change the world sound might sound like i'm being hyperbolic but i'm not because you know yeah. It's a big section of living is reading and literature, especially in this little corner that we call fantasy. And those yeah. people have changed it for, you know, forever for better, in my opinion, and yeah. set, set us on our way. And uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, for and sure. To yeah. Be one of those giants just for one person would yeah. be incredible. Would oh, be yeah. really incredible. I think John Gwen is a really good example of this. John Gwen does not have the notoriety of a George R. R. Martin, but John Gwen, uh, when I finished reading The Faithful and the Fallen, I remember thinking, like, I I kind of want to do this. Like, I, yeah. I want to see, I want to try my hand here because he's taking a lot of the things that I know and love, and he's just doing it in a little bit of a different way, yeah, uh, with his own flavor. And this guy had a story that he wanted to tell that he obviously felt, you know, here in his heart and he put it on paper and you can feel the, the yeah. passion, especially in ruin and wrath. You can really yeah. feel that passion. And yeah. I just think there's something really no, uh, noble about that. And it's I agree. That, that motivates me to get out of bed in the morning. Yeah. There's a lot of heart in those books. And I uh, experienced that when I was a kid reading Lord of the Rings, that that is what got me <laughs> to on the path that I'm on now really it was this 12 year old kid thinking, I want to do this, you know, yeah. and, uh, in so many ways, even unconsciously, I was doing it. Uh, I wanted to be a writer, but I also ended up being an old English scholar, which is what Tolkien did. And a lot of that is in. So I would describe my book. Dino asked uh, the premise there. So um, a lot of the book is um, the trilogy that is, is uh, I would describe it briefly as Beowulf meets Buddhism. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Beowulf meets Buddha. Uh, this is uh, so there are a lot of influences in there, just from real world places that are in the past and also in the present that I've that, that I've been in. There's certainly an old English and an old Norse flavor to to part of the world that I've created, but there's also there's a there's a Celtic part of it too because I, I spent time learning Welsh when I was younger and uh, had a great time with that. And um, so there's a you know. A Celtic part, but there's also I've also lived in South Asia, and I, I, I speak, oh. um, yeah, I speak uh, Nepali, which is a South Asian. It's related to Hindi and, and all that. So, uh, so there's a lot of that uh, South Asian uh, inspiration in there as well. So it's it's a lot of you know I think the the books that you the book that you write, especially the first one, is definitely going to be an expression some of the most important things that happen to you in your life. Um, so I, I think that's, that's probably the case for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's excellent. Yeah. 
Um, can, can we can we get a little more? Can we can we, can we get a little? You know, people. Someone said elevator pitch. You know, I mean, I, I, you don't have to give us all, but like you know, if you don't feel comfortable, you don't have to, of course. But well, it's uh, you mean Beowulf meets Buddhism wasn't enough. You know, just <laughs> you know, just a little bit more, just a little bit more. Okay, yeah. Well, also, I'll tell you this: there, there's magic. Uh, it's <laughs> so it's a magic system that is based on empathy. So it's an em empathic magical system that is in there. And there is, uh, you mentioned Brian Lee Durfee has a lot of religion in, in his. Uh, yeah. So there is there is a religious war going on um, as well. That, that's part of the context. Those are always fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there, that's that's part of it as well. So um, and then, of course, you know, there, there are some main characters uh, trying to get through all this. Uh, uh, but. That's all I guess I've got right now. Um, okay, that's fine. I'll come up with a better blurb for the back cover eventually. Can, dude, if, if you get, uh, you're going to let me write a blurb on the back, right? Yeah. Oh, are you kidding? Uh, I would be honored if uh, if you would let, write one of the blurbs for the book. See. Yeah. The most illuminating fantasy of our time by the man <laughs> with the largest arms in the world. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be your blurb, not mine, man. So. <laughs> They don't call him doctor for nothing. He's saving the genre. How about that? Is that? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, that might be a little uh, exaggerated. But, yeah. That's what I'm here for, man. <laughs> I'm here to hype you up. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I want to read it now. I'm not going to lie. And I have like a lot of faith in you, uh, even though I've never read anything that you've ever, you know, obviously written. Uh, this is true. But I have a lot of faith in you yeah. because I, I yeah. love the way you talk about books. Uh, and also you're very... You're, you're really smart <laughs> so that goes a long way i think <laughs> well you know it i i don't know about how smart i am i i consider myself <laughs> in many ways a slow learner it depends on the realm too honestly you know if i'm uh I'm, you're asking me to to uh do some handy stuff you know fix a car or something like that i can promise you i i don't look very smart um so i'm with you on there yeah yeah, yeah. for sure i'm calling so it on. really depends on the realm i mean people can be smart in so many different ways too um but i have definitely spent a lot of time with books and and uh and a long time aspiration is to write them and so yeah the, the book to beefcake yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, Alan asked, "How many Krupp pus type characters do you have in your in your story, Philip?" I don't have any, Alan. I'm sorry. I know you would have loved that, um, but I don't <laughs> have a Krupp. I'm sure there are a couple characters in there, though. I do have one that I think you would do a wonderful imitation of. Actually, I do have one character. He's a priest, uh, and his name is Bagsack. Uh, <laughs> You would love that guy, Alan. I'm sure. Uh, I would love to hear your bag sack impersonation. Yeah, oh, that's a real name, by the way, in Old English. So. Really? Yeah, I, I, I kid you not. Oh, you know what? I'm going to expose myself for how stupid I am. Okay, so I didn't know that. So in in Malazan, I've already been reading it, obviously. And there's like talk the younger and then talk the older. And yeah. I thought that was so clever by Erickson. Turns out that's actually. In 79 CE, back in Pompeii, that was a, a very popular naming structure in Pompeii. Uh huh. Uh huh. And I didn't know that. It was like Plinky the Younger. He wrote the what would happen during Pompeii during the volcanic explosion with the pyroclastic flames and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. And it was they really, you know, they said they read it and they said by Plinky the Younger, uh, you know, who was unfortunately had to deal with the death of uh, Plinky the Elder. And I was like, what <laughs> you know i just didn't know that so that's how dumb i am i was excited to talk about that tonight so that shows you how boring of a day i had it's a I, thing though <laughs> yeah it's like junior you know thank you junior basically. yeah now i just want to name uh my kid boy or girl uh and i don't have a kid yet uh but when i do i want to name it james so i can call him james the younger that's awesome you could do that you could do that uh we all know <laughs> i'm i'm obviously gonna name my kid whiskey jack um that would uh, be cool <laughs> Vermillionaire says uh, they just f finished forgetting moon and it was fire. And I agree. Um, and some other people were saying, talking about how you said you had religious themes in your book. Uh, yeah. Hannah's book said she loves uh, religious commentary and fantasy. And I, and I do too. It's probably my favorite theme to be explored at the present moment because I do a lot of uh, reading and I watch a lot of stuff on uh, religion. I find it to be very fascinating, especially the history yeah. behind yeah. it. So for sure. Yeah. 
I, oh. I tell you what, Philip, I think you're going to sell at least a hundred copies based on the comments that I'm seeing in here. Cause I'm buying, <laughs> I'm buying two, you know, I got one for the bathroom yeah. and then one for you gotta my have one for the chair. bathroom of and, course. Uh, you know, Christmas presents for everybody, you know, I'm of sure. course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> That's really kind though. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, cover art. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. Yeah. You got to go with the pulpy. I don't know about pulpy, but it's interesting. Book covers are, are how they've evolved, you know, since uh, I feel like the 80s has a distinctive uh, kind of feel to it there with the you're more likely to, to have a lot of flesh on the cover of a fantasy book, you know, <laughs> I think, and it published in the 80s, right? Um, I like that. A lot of flesh. I like a lot that. of flesh. Yeah. The, the metal bikinis and all that. And, uh, <laughs> Nothing gets all right. Everyone, right now, open up your tab in your browser and look up "Heroes Die" by Matthew Stover. It is the oh. worst fantasy cover of all time. I think some Wheel of Time covers also vie oh, for that title. I Sorry, love them. yeah, yeah. I love Sorry. them. They're terrible. Perrin yeah. looks. Perrin looks like he's like four foot nine, and he, <laughs> and he just looks grumpy. And it's like that's not how I picture Perrin at all. Yeah. No. That I. I don't know what happened there with the Wheel of Time covers, uh, but uh, a lot of them just ooze 80s cheese. But um, I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, even though they were published in the 90s and the 2000s, uh, some of them got a little better later on, but um, they were uh, just awful. Um, almost, it feels like deliberately so, but... Um, Oh, thanks, man. Man, you're getting all of the love. And, and, and you know, Lost Discovery says the thumbnail for this stream would have been a great <laughs> That's true. We airbrushed a little bit on there. I think we got something. A wee bit of flesh there, man. A little Just bit. a wee bit of flesh. Yeah. I put that up and I was like, is this a bad idea? <laughs> <laughs> Am I going to get demonetized? <laughs> I think it was a great idea, actually. And I'm glad you did it. Although I look like a toothpick next to you. You so. look great. You're toned. You're toned. Yeah. Okay. Well, you could tell anyway, you, you have, you have that stamina. You could just tell, you know, I'm going to yeah. get tired in like three minutes. That's like jujitsu. Yeah. If I can get a hold of you, I'm good. But if you make me chase you around, you got to catch me first, man. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm still pretty fast, even though I'm almost 50. So, yeah. You look great for 50, Philip. I, you really oh. do. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> As long as, you know, as long as I can still bend over to tie my shoes, I'm, I'm, I feel pretty good. So it depends on the day for me, man. It depends yeah. on the day. That's the thing I learned a little bit late in life. Let's talk about slow learning. Fl flexibility is just as important, if not more important than strength. You can ask my wife. I stretch 20 minutes a day, every day. Yep. Yep, um, yep. I, I, I pinched my sciatic nerve when I was like 21. I and just, it, yeah. had, it was like a reoccurring thing. And I learned the value of yoga and stretching yeah. very early uh in my adulthood and if it wasn't for that i mean i i would have been messed up man so yep. Yep. stretch when you're listening to your audiobooks folks that's what i do i'll put on the audiobook and i'll just get on the floor start stretching out cats come over and hang out with me it's i nice. actually listen to a lot of uh booktubers while i'm doing I, I take half an hour a day to stretch actually every day yep. so I, and I, i'm listening to some of the people in the chat right now while i'm doing my stretches so yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anna Mander is the only real choice for it. I, I actually pitched <laughs> yes. Anna Mander to my wife and she was like, absolutely not. <laughs> oh no. So a couple oh, a couple names that we've talked about that that she gave the green light, because I'm I'm always, you know, going for uh fantasy names. Uh we we did get Perrin's on the list. Oh, I like wow. the name Perrin because yeah. you call him Perry, so that's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh Perrin, Liliana. I, I name Perrin, by the way. Oh, do you really? Yep. Yep. Oh yeah, I, I love the name Perrin for a boy or a girl actually. Yep. Um, and then I think the other one was uh, Liliana, uh, oh, like which that. is Liliana the Veil for Magic the Gathering because I'm a nerd and I used to play a lot of Magic the Gathering. Wow. Okay. Huh. Right, and Brent says stretching is huge, especially for shoulders. Most people have really poor shoulder oh, yeah. mobility due to sitting at a desk all day, and that's true. And also, yep. people who lift, especially in the barbell sense with be barbell bench press, tend to hunch forward. Um, I actually only use dumbbells for that purpose because it gives me better shoulder mobility. And then oh, yeah. everyone at home, if you want to try that, and this is not a fitness podcast, but go put your arms on a wall, right? Like this flat against the wall with your back flat. And then just try to pull your elbows down the wall without letting your arms come off the wall. And you're going to realize how not flexible you are in your shoulders. It's right. actually painful, um, but that's a great stretch for people to do. And I read a lot. 
No, I know you do too, obviously. And I'm always like, you know, I'm hunched over. Oh, yeah, that's why I lie down when I read. Yeah. Do you really? Always. I'm always How? lying down when I read. It was so. Uh, Alan was talking about um, on on a video he made recently about how he'll you know he'll be sitting and, and doing like the chicken drills when he's reading at late at night and he's trying to stay awake and for me it's I'm lying down reading and when I'm getting tired the book falls on my face boom you know and that wakes me up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's incredible. <laughs> Yep. So that's, that's what I know. It's time to, to probably go to sleep, but Oh, that's so cool. I love it. That, that's oh, so cool. Man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's how I read is lying down. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's so funny. Cause I've dropped my cell phone before and it just clangs you in the teeth and you're like, Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Ooh, that hurts. Oh. Books are a little softer than cell phones. So. Yeah. You get a little bit of a flatter because the cell phone's going to spin usually, you know what I mean? Um, you know, another name that I'm going to name, uh, if I, if I would have a boy, uh, I, I don't know why I'm saying it, but Leonin, I like the name Leonin, which is short for Leo, which is, this is such a good segue. One of the best characters in the new age of madness trilogy by Joe Abercrombie that, uh, yeah. you know, just got wrapped up and we both, yeah. we, we talked about it before, but man, how good was wisdom of crowds. I said in my review, that I think it, I, I know it's in my top five books of the year and it's vying for first place. I love, wow. I loved wisdom of crowds. I just think Abercrombie gets better and better with every book. And I know it's maybe not universal, but I love the age of madness. I think it's his best stuff yet yes. because I feel like his books have always been, yeah, good transition. Nice segue. <laughs> Um, his books have always been entertaining. They've always been fun, vivid characters, great action. Mm -hmm. I mean, the guy's just so, so talented in so many ways, but what I like even more, I feel like he's done all those things brilliantly in age of madness, but he's incorporated themes in ever so subtly away. But I feel like that age of madness has a little more depth than anything else he's written so far. I would agree I love that. that. I love that. I just think that he's added that depth. There's a Dickensian element to Age of Madness that this is a book that I could teach in, in my fantasy novels class, right? Because there's there's meat there that is just absolutely conducive to a lot of analysis and discussion. So um, I, I just feel like Wisdom of Crowds was the best Abercrombie book I've read yet. And yeah. I love it. And it made me very, very sad too. But you know, that's that's the thing with Abercrombie. You're not gonna get the warm and fuzzy all the time. No, and you know, I you know, everyone said, you know, he's like the poster child for he he is like the pop icon for Grimdark, right? Like he's the guy you say, you know what yeah. I mean? That's just what yeah. people do. Well, he's Lord Grimdark, right? Yeah, he is Lord Grimdark. He he stole the tag, so it means it's official, right? Uh <laughs> I felt like wisdom of crowds. I don't get too um what's the word I'm looking for? Like it doesn't make me like it doesn't feel so grim because I'm always laughing, right? When I'm reading Trevor Crombie. Yeah. Wisdom of Crowds, I thought was his most grim book. Hmm. Um, and it's just the way certain scenes resonated with me. We're not gonna say any spoilers, folks, but right. um there was just some things happening and the reality of these people being in the situations and they're not getting bailed out, they're dealing with these repercussions to you know this revolution that's happening, and I'm just like, this is pretty like bleak. And it was the first time I think in a long time where I felt I was like, oh yeah, this is grim dark. Like this is uh, heavy stuff. And I yeah. thought wisdom of crowds was phenomenal. I love the ending. I feel like the door's wide open to continue going. Um, I hope he does. <laughs> uh, in first law. Yeah. I think he's working on uh, something that's outside of first law now. Right. Yes. Is it a series or a standalone? Because he said, uh, I saw in the interview, one of the interviews he did, he's done a lot. I think it was a Patrick maybe. Uh, and he said that he likes to switch from series to standalones because it's not as big. He can get it done. So I don't know if his new project, if, if anyone knows, let me know in chat, but, uh, I don't know if it's a series or if it's a standalone or, or what he's going for here. Yeah. I don't know. I, I did hear him describe it. Oh yeah. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that yeah. void was very real. And I just, uh, man, I was so sad. I was like, I don't have any more first law. Like it's it, it, there's it, that too, yeah. Yeah. It, right from what happens in the, in the book, you're it's a little bit uh, um, it's a, it's melancholy to think. Oh, is this the last? I don't think. So. I mean, I think there'll be more first law eventually. I hope so. But, yes, I I think so. Yeah. I think that um, 
that door is open and there's still so much more mileage to get out of the characters that he introduced in the trilogy. And a lot of people talk about Joe Abercrombie's characters, but one of the things that I, I think you have to give him a nod for, and this is something Erickson does very well uh, as well, but Abercrombie didn't like he had an all star cast in the first trilogy. Like people even say, you know, I didn't care for the plot, but those, yeah, the characters are great, but it just wasn't for me, whatever very few of those characters maintain them, themselves throughout the rest of the series. Like he kept creating new characters or cashing in on side characters that were, you know, barely introduced and then they get a more prominent role later. Right. So he did it over and over and over again. And the guy just does not miss. And I think that yeah. that is like why he's one of the best character writers of all time. You know why he doesn't miss because, and I've heard him talk about this, he edits the crap out of his books. And I believe he it. Will, he will go back and say, no, this voice isn't distinct enough. What can I do to make this voice distinct? Because he's got the most distinct voices I've ever read. In, in Without fans. a doubt. Very distinct. And that's something he goes back and he will deliberately work on and work on until he hits that. So, I mean, the, the guy is, is brilliant. Uh, I mean, he's one of the... The few who, and uh, I've talked about this before, um, Alan's talked about it and other people too, but the idea that you could just open up a book, see some dialogue, not know who's talking, and then realize, oh, that's so-and-so talking. That's Logan, or that's Glockta. Yeah. Hey, Jonna. Hey, Jonna. Um, yeah, I mean, you can do that with Abercrombie. I suspect better than with any other author, I think. Um, so. Yeah, and, and he wrote three of the tightest books I've ever read in my life. Um mm -hmm. I believe he edited the the crap out of him because yeah, like, like Benjamin just said, there's no not a waste of sense or word wisdom across it. I would say in the trilogy, even I, I didn't feel like yeah. that. Um, and for a, a story that the scope isn't as epic as a lot of the other fantasies that we read, mm -hmm. um, I I can't hold that against Joe because he's doing exactly what he wants to do and he's telling the exact stories that he wants with the scope and everything. Cause when I think of things like a song of ice fire, I'm like, Oh, it's so much more broad. It's there. There's so many more th things going off and whatever, but the way Joe executes what he does is just to a T. Yeah. It's just so yeah. good. It doesn't need to be that big and epic thing. It's, it's more of an intimate personal story that I, I love. I just love yeah. it. Well, he does episodic stuff really well. Like he'll, he'll yes. he, he doesn't, uh, I think when, when I agree with the people who are saying like Benjamin that uh, no wasted words, mm -hmm. he doesn't do a lot of exposition. He doesn't spend no. a lot of time on description. A lot of that is just filled in in your mind as you're reading. Um, but he won't, he, I, I don't know if I can point to a place where he goes back and he sort of explains and, you know, you know, a year ago, this happened, blah, blah, blah. And then we get to the story, you know, he doesn't do that. He just starts right in the moment. And that's yeah. what he'll do. And he'll, that moment, once that moment is done, he'll go to another moment and, and that'll be another perspective character, you know? So it just yeah. feels like the pacing of his books is so good because of that, because he, obviously every writer has to do exposition, but you don't notice him doing the exposition. He works it into the scenes really, really well. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, and he does research very well, Shelly. You're right. He uh, he's one that goes outside. Philip was saying about talking about writing earlier, going outside of the fantasy genre and doing more and more. Yeah. You know, he's very interested in obviously the French Revolution. Um, he loved I believe it was the Civil War. Um, but I was watching this whenever he did the standalones, he reached for films for inspiration. Uh -huh. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like two yeah, I love how he's he's done for all of his books. He's, he's sort of done a little, you know, twist. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got the Western in Red Country, for example. You've got the Revenge Tale in Best Served Cold. And you've got the, the sort of, in, in Age of Madness is really more of that, uh, you know, kind of, there's a French Revolution element to it, but it also <laughs> is this Industrial Revolution kind of thing going on and the class, uh, the class warfare and, and that sort of thing. So kind of Dickens and Elizabeth Gaskell and, and that sort of thing, you know, North and South and all that. So. Yeah. And also what happens after a revolution? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Things get nasty. Yeah. That, that's one of the things I really enjoyed about the last two books in a song of ice and fire as well is what happens after these massive moments where power switches hands or yeah. power leaves or, or is removed. Uh, yeah. You know, that, that that's not an easy thing to write. Uh, a lot of times books end on that note, right? <laughs> they end 
Yeah, I, I don't want to ruin anything. So I, I'm thinking of a series off the top of my head right now that ends this way, but it ends with this big change of power and someone seizes it. And then it's like the story's over. But having to actually decide what happens after that, I think, is is one of the more interesting things that an author can do. And I know that Gurm looked at Tolkien like that. He said what the famous line is, what was Aragorn's tax plan? <laughs> <laughs> that was like his Gurm's big fa- of his favorite thing to say. Huh. You know, yeah. Arag- Aragorn rolled, but uh, was he any good at rolling? I, I don't know if uh, <laughs> if Tolkien. <laughs> <It's> just- <laughs> That's a perfect George R. R. Martin invitation, my friend. <laughs> good night, Carson <laughs> Andrews. Have a good one. Thanks for coming. Yes. All the way from Dublin. Yeah. And very cool avatar. Yeah. Yes, I've been oh, yeah. I've been working on my uh my George impersonations. Um, so whatever. that is spot on, my friend. That is really good. I'm when he asked me to finish the books, I'll be able to put on a little conductor hat and suspenders and uh, go out there just being a you know just being a giga chad and finishing out the best series. <laughs> You're of gonna all have time. to grow a long beard too, though. Oh, that's impossible. Wow. <laughs> Unfortunately. Oh man. Lost Discovery says, "I feel like Joe Abercrombie just understands humans so yeah. damn." well yeah he understands also the worst parts of humans which unfortunately in times of revolution tend to pop up a little bit a little bit yeah yeah i I mean human psychology uh there are these competing parts of our brain and uh you know sometimes the uh the more reptilian primitive parts win out win out especially in times of crisis and abercrombie so gets that and I think he poses a question in, in his books, you know, are we just fundamentally selfish creatures, you know, and, and uh, are, are we capable of, of real altruism and nobility and, and, and that sort of thing? And, and there are moments, there are moments that make me think Joe Abercrombie might actually like people a little bit. Just a More little. so in this trilogy than the last one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, yeah. Oh, and Sarah saying good night. Good night, Sarah. Good night, Sarah. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that he understands people. I, I totally agree with with uh, Lost in Discovery. He just gets people so well. Um, and he was a psychology major, as I think most people know. Oh, um, I didn't know that. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was a psych major, I believe, oh. and he was at university. So um, very cool. And, yeah, and that, I think that that served him well. So yeah. Someone said I should do a, vo- a career. I actually, I, I will say, if I can listen to someone long enough, I can generally do a decent impression. Uh, it's kind of my thing at work, actually, because uh, we do a stand-up call every single day, and uh, I've gotten really good at imitating some of my coworkers. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it just, maybe, maybe one day I'll do an impersonation of booktubers. Oh, now that would be, uh, I think, a hit. Yeah. Yeah, I think I could probably do it pretty well. Yeah, I suspect you could. I could definitely do you. I won't do it right now, but it's going to happen. Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) And by the way, congratulations on 10,000 subscribers. Everybody, Philip just hit 10,000. Wow. That is so many. Huh. That's five digits. Right. That's that's yeah. I mean, I'd be lying if I didn't say that feels good. Um, It it feels great. Um, You know, but like we were saying before, uh, it's, I, I mean, I'm just humbled that, that anybody would want to hear what I have to say about anything, uh, for, you know, voluntarily. Uh, so it's, it's really, really, oh yeah, Jimmy, you should totally do Alan. Then. Oh, I could do Alan easy. Okay. It's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh dear. Yeah. I'll have to tweak it a little bit, but that's the gist. Oh, no, that's a good start. That's a good start. Um, but yeah, no, that's a good start. But yeah, no, I mean, what, what we, um, what we get out of this is again, what we, like we were saying before, it's, it's the community, it's the people. And, and I've learned so, so much from everybody and um, just humbled that that many people would, would even want to, you know, listen to what I have to say about this stuff. So, but uh, yeah, I'm, and I'm very grateful very grateful to be in chats like this with, with really wonderful people like you, Jimmy, and uh, like uh, many of the, the people in the, who are in the chat right now who've left comments on the channel and, and all that is just, oh, yeah. You, could you do an Australian accent? Hey, guys, it's me, Christian. And today we're going to be talking about One Piece. <laughs> That's pretty good. You got to work in a good day, mates, or something. <laughs> okay? I mean, you, you go with the whole stereotype, you know, so... <laughs> Right now, 
<laughs> he's probably threw his keyboard at his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. Yeah. So, yeah. How was Jimmy's Australian accent? It was shit. <laughs> Yeah. I thought you sounded a little cockney there, maybe. But. I don't know. Christian had, to me, <laughs> Christian had to tell me that they have different seasons down there, man. I'm not, I, listen, the Southwest, Northwest Virginia education system didn't do me any favors. All right? Well, yeah, they're in the Southern Hemisphere. So, yeah. Yeah. They're in, they're in spring right now, I guess, right? Yeah. Something like that. I, I gave, I gave him a crap because I was like, why are you wearing a beanie in the middle of summer? And he's like, mate, it's winter. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Oops. I knew that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't. Oh, I yeah, can't rock do that Mark. mustache. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, he has some amazing facial hair. He does. I'm kind of envious of his mustache. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Busted pluggers. Oh man, those are too good. Huh. Don't do. Uh, I have a lot of. <laughs> uh, I got a lot of people from down under that uh, probably <laughs> not gonna lie. I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, they'll get over it. It's okay. <laughs> Yeah, you, just, <laughs> you gotta. And he did say mate there. But, <laughs> I say mate all the time because of because of lost and discovery. Oh, because of him. Time. Okay, <laughs> that's it's so funny. funny. Oh yeah. my goodness. Yeah. Uh, what were we talking about right before? <laughs> oh, you. I have no about. idea. But uh, you got to make the video where you where you imitate a bunch of booktubers. That'll be fun. It's yeah. gonna happen. It's gonna yeah. happen. Yeah. I was gonna ask you. Now that you've been here and you've established an audience, is there something that you haven't done yet on BookTube? It may be a type of video or content that like you you see yourself doing in the future or you'd like to get to. Like what's next? Wow. Uh, I mean, I love doing book reviews uh, and reading the books and the discussions are really, really where it's at for me. Um, yeah. So I just hope to keep meeting people and, and branching out and being challenged uh, by reading books that I haven't read before and from types of authors that I, I haven't read yet. And uh, so that that's important to me uh, to keep challenging myself in, in that way, in terms of the type of video. I mean, when I started this thing, I didn't know what a tag was. People were doing these things called tags. <laughs> I had, what is it? It took me like months to figure out what is a tag? What is this thing called a tag? And why are they answering all these weird questions? Um, so that took me a while to figure out. So I've, I'm proud of myself that I can do a tag video now. <laughs> um, so in terms of type of content, I think uh, I'm challenged enough doing uh, the uh, the reviews and the and the discussions. That's mainly what I'm here for. But I'm also here for the community. Yeah. So you know, when somebody tags me, I'm gonna do a tag and have fun with it. Uh, so I think it's good to be a little lighthearted sometimes. Yeah. For sure. Um, so yeah, but just the type of books. Like I read a book this year. I know you recently read because I, I loved your your video on it. Um, uh, it's uh, Piranesi. Oh, um, so good! Such a great book. And I uh, probably, I mean, I actually read before coming to BookTube. I did read Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell by Susanna Clark. Oh, nice. And I love the book. And she's one of the reasons why I started the channel. Actually, really, because again, the premise is. Fantasy is worth talking about. Fantasy is worth analyzing and thinking about and, and all of that. So, and I thought, wow, you know, uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell is a great example of that. Uh, so it took me a little while to get around to reading Peter Nese. I don't know why, because it, it's a short book. It's a really, you can read it in Very the afternoon. Short. Yeah. yeah. But wow, how, it's so different and so moving. And I just, even talking about it right now, I feel this incredible sense of nostalgia and, and, and kind of sweet melancholy. It's just yeah. such, a, such a beautiful book. And I loved what you had to say about it too. I mean, I, obviously it hit you in a way you maybe you weren't even expecting, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, it shocked me. I said it's a, it was a, you know, it was my random book every month I do with my patrons and they they randomly, you know, they give me books, I randomly select one essentially is what happens. And Paranessi is a book that I would have never read this year. I wouldn't have read it next year, not even the year after that. It's a book I thought sounded interesting. It just didn't have any place in my TBR. Yeah. And uh, which is a shame because standalones get lost in the shuffle for me a lot. But I, this forced me to read it and I'm so glad I did because it was uh, just a delight. It was just a delight. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. I got a lot from it. And the best books are the ones that make me want to talk about it. And I want to talk about Paranesi. I just want to continuously talk about it. Uh, I even got one of my coworkers to read it. And, you know, oh. she was telling me what she pulled from it and the themes. It was totally different from what I did. Uh -huh. um, so and that that's the cool thing about that book is I think it's open for interpretation and how you apply it to whatever, um, you know, what the labyrinth really is. So, 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, I mean, I've had great discussions uh, with my wife about it because she read it too, and uh, and and it's just a it's it is it's a very provocative, evocative book, you know, um, and haunting and. And somehow yeah. it's so beautiful. And I think great books do that, right? They just sort of like mirrors that are held up to us and we can mm -hmm. kind of see ourselves in them and explore what it means to be a, a human being. Um, so yeah, that's just such a great book. And that's a good example of the sort of thing I, I, I've read that I, I, I don't know if I would have, you know, necessarily. Um, I, I, ex my, my life, my reading life has expanded. Uh, and so for me, that's, you know, that's enough of a challenge to to keep learning about new great authors and and uh, all of that and engaging with people. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah I'll she's I'll be great. reading all of her stuff. She's phenomenal. Yeah, she's got a, actually a collection I think of short stories. She has a, a third book. It's not uh, as well known as uh, Jonathan Strange, Mister Norrell, or Piranesi, but uh, I, I believe she has another book that uh, might be a, a short story collection. But. Yeah. Uh, Brandon said he's eagerly waiting for uh, UNAP to do Realm of the Elderlings, which will be pink content. If I can sneak into one of those discussions, I, I would like Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Yeah, um, it would be so great to have you. I mean, Rob has been having a good, uh, a, a great, um, you know, time on, on BookTube, uh, I think. And, and yeah. justifiably, she is so... I still am, and uh, I've only read the uh, the Farseer trilogy and Life of Traders myself. So, yeah. and I'm just, I'm really, really chomping at the bit to to read all of realm of the elderlings i don't feel like i i, I feel a little bit like a fake until i read all of the realm of the elderlings so oh man tiny uh, man and oh, fits in tiny man right here is, is is just a lot of people's favorites uh so i'm looking forward to it but but i have to say i i'm so glad i'm gonna do it this way uh with ap because mm -hmm. the the doing the malazan books with him has been uh, i've said this a couple times but it is it I wrote a dissertation to get a PhD and it was a long project and, it, you know, writing a book and all that. I feel like I have gone on a journey just as profound while reading these books with AP and, and just doing that with somebody like that. And, and especially somebody as um, astute and, and as brilliant as AP is, it, it's just been such a rich experience. Yeah. Um, so, and I know that realm of the elderlings has depth enough for us to have all kinds of great discussions on it. And so I'm really looking forward to doing that next year. And we're not going to do it straight through. We're going to start probably, I mean, we haven't talked y'all through yet, but we're going to probably do Farce here and then do a, a couple other books together and maybe a different trilogy. And then we'll go back and do live ship and then do another, yeah. you know, something else and then go back and do Tawny man. And then something. so it'll take us probably a year uh, and a half, maybe two years to get through them all. But, uh, but so, why not? I mean, they're so good. So how do you and AP structure your, your read alongs with each other? Like you want to talk more about that and why it's been, I, I mean, obviously we know why, cause you guys are both brilliant and, and you're talking back and forth, but what about the structure of it has, has led your Malaz and read through, and then eventually your realm of the elderlings to be so valuable. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have, uh, we sort of worked it out in the beginning. He didn't have a channel. And, uh, so we did the first two, uh, the gardens of the moon, non-spoiler and the spoiler were on my channel. Um, and then, I sort of kept at him and Steven Erickson wanted him to start a channel too. I think he mentioned that when he was talking. Yeah. 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 So he, he did. And I'm so glad because he really offers on, on his channel stuff that I think no one else that I know of on, on booktube offers just his uh, insights into narrative structure and, and all that stuff. So, yeah. um, and he, don't forget, he actually has a PhD in fantasy. Like the, his PhD is in yeah. this, right? So mine is in medieval. I'm, I'm a medievalist. Um, so that's, that's my, uh, my day job, but fantasy for me is something I do for fun. But, um, but yeah, he, he got his PhD in it. So, so anyway, we decided that we would do, uh, after he started a channel, that we would do the non-spoiler on my channel um, because I have a sort of a, a little bit more of a general kind of channel where I, I do a lot of other stuff in addition to Malazan. Yeah, absolutely. And he he will be doing other stuff besides Malazan eventually. It's just that we're doing this massive, you know, read uh, of the series, not just uh, Erickson's Malazan Book of Fallen, but also Esselmont's novels of the Malazan Empire. So. Um, so, uh, so we do the spoilers on his channel and, uh, that's how we've worked it out. And we've been 
lucky enough to actually talk to both Ericsson and Esselmont at various points. Um, and that's been <laughs> mind blowing, uh, just crazy to be able to talk to these guys, uh, the creators of all this. Um, and yeah, he totally is unique. He's a, Oh, he's phenomenal. Yeah. What he brings is just, I think, so different from what anyone else brings. Uh, and I don't know if anyone else could, uh, you know, he's just so uh, good at what he does. So, but yeah, talking to Ericsson and Esselmont, what a highlight for me. Um, and fairly recently, I had a chance to, Ericsson asked me to uh, translate a, a poem he wrote into Old English. So I did that for him and yeah. had a discussion with him on the poem. And and I learned so much about the series just by talking about this one poem with Steven Erickson. And he blew my mind during that discussion, just talking about what that, and there's parts of the discussion later on that you wouldn't want to hear unless you've read through the whole series. Uh, right. There are spoilers for the series. But the, um, you know, there's a, the, most of the video is him reading the poem, me reading my old English translation of it. Um, and, and just, wow, the, I mean, you talk to the guy, and it just feels like you, you, you've, you've been enlightened, you know, it's, it's yeah. really cool. It's really cool. So, so I've been lucky to have that be part of the experience as well. Um, and I do agree with, uh, however it said, Faisal, Faisal, uh, I agree, you know, he's, he's, he and Esselmont to me, what they've created is the greatest series ever. Uh, that's my opinion. Um, yeah, I know. Yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just Malazan is, is, for me, and I, we talked about this when I was here before, Jimmy, how I, I feel like they have shown what fantasy can be in, yes. in, in, in what they've done. Uh, they absolutely, the way I said it was, they freed my imagination, you know, um, so. Uh, and I know exactly what you mean now that I've, I've read, you know, I'm in the, I'm about done with book five. Yeah. You know, yeah. I thought about that quote a lot. Uh, yeah. a, as I've read through and I totally understand where you're coming from. And yeah. I keep saying that Erickson's like kind of the successor to Tolkien in a lot of ways, because he is doing big things. He's doing very big things yeah. with history yeah. and lore that is just untouchable. Really? Yeah. You know, um, I don't think he is my favorite author and I don't uh -huh. know if Malazan will end up being my, I, I don't think Malazan will end up being my number one series, but what right. I can definitively say there's nothing else like it and yeah. it, and in my in my opinion it is the next it, it is the next step after like where do we go after tolkien inspired fantasy well i think that what he has done with esselmont is probably the answer to that um yeah. and who knows i got five more books and a bunch of standalone so i could i could totally eat my words and you know it ended up being my favorite of all time it's definitely top yeah. top five top ten for sure yeah um, and i've never anything like it and I love the fact that if you want to be a just a Malazan reader, I, I said this to Philip before we went live, you could read Malazan books for decades and still yeah. be learning yep. and still be pulling things out. And they can mean something in a totally different context. Um, I definitely feel that with Midnight Tides. I feel like I'm missing a lot of themes because um, mm. I'm dumb. <laughs> but no. you, you know what I mean? It's just like, they really are tales of the Malaz and Book of the Fallen because right. each one, even though it obviously is is a part of a series, it feels so contextualized of what he was trying to accomplish in each of the books uh, that you could probably uh, you talk to five different people if I have five different favorite books from this, like House of Chains, for instance. Like I always say that on people's bottom, I, it's pretty good. Like I I don't know where I'd rank it right now off the top of my head, but it's definitely high. Yeah. So I think uh, I think it's just it's something special. And whenever you do something special in a genre that has, you know, so many things that have been retold and repackaged, that that's something to re to remark on. Yeah. Well, if you're dumb, so am I, Jimmy, because um, I'm, I'm reading it the second time through and I'm seeing a ton of things that I didn't get the first time. And it is a series that I think is and this isn't for everybody, by the way. Some people just want to, you know, read through a series once and go on to it. There's a lot of great books to read out there. Um, but absolutely true that it is a series that rewards rereads in an incredible way Just yeah your, your experience my experience the second time through i loved it the first time by the way um but the second time through it's just been you know earth shattering it's it's been it's sublime the the best word i've ever heard to describe it is sublime so yeah yeah, yeah. i i think uh he impresses me in so many different ways with each book. And I can, I can tell, say this, I felt like in midnight tides, I could tell a huge leap. And I was told this would happen. 
Um, so maybe it's a preconceived notion, but it feels like his writing really leveled up in Midnight Tides, like his mm-hmm. prose and stuff, I feel is much stronger. Um, you know, what's funny. I actually like thinking back on it, like Gardens of the Moon might be my favorite Malaz. I think it's Memories of Ice. I think Memories of Ice is my favorite out of the first five so far. Let, we'll see how we'll see how Midnight Tides ends because I just started part four. But man, Gardens of the Moon was so freaking awesome. Yeah, I mean, it, I, Gardens I of the Moon it. is just sort of the big, you know, holding nothing back, introducing this, this series that dares to do stuff that nobody else is doing. And, you know, it, and nobody in fantasy anyway. I mean, he does a lot of stuff that uh, quote unquote literary authors will do, you know, um, and does it in fantasy. And, and so I, I just think he does such a, a, a great job of, mixing up the humor and the yeah. you know the epic the 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 explosive stuff that's there if you, if you love that uh, along with for me and I know some people complain about characters um but I think his characters are brilliant and vivid they are not okay so the I think what what I is like an impediment that. for a lot of people maybe the fact that the, the characters are not the center of everything there's no one character or no group of characters that are the heroes of the story. Mm-hmm. And that bothers people who are especially used to fantasy, I think, because we want to follow along with the hero and, and triumph when he triumphs and, and you know, um, and win when the hero wins and all that. And that that's not what Malazan is. It's a different experience, I think, from that. And there's, by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of my favorite books are, are, are you know, follow that traditional route. Um, but Eric's is doing something so different to me and yet something so I feel like authentic with his characters that they they seem to occupy a place that I feel that I occupy when I'm looking up at the stars on a clear night and seeing that there's a vast universe out there. Yeah. And I yeah. feel like his characters are a lot like me in the world. And he is a remarkably good at giving you a full sense of a character in a very short space as well. I think um, I, so. I actually agree. I said that there might not be a more efficient writer when it comes to uh, getting a character over uh, with the, with the reader. Yeah. Um, I, that was the biggest misconception I had going into Malaz and that the characters would suck. And I actually love a lot of the characters. I mean, to and bug are <laughs> then midnight tides are astounding. Astoundingly <laughs> so good. To my favorite character of the whole series. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I will say this. The one thing that Malazan seems to be missing for me is I wish we got a little bit more of the, of the non, not non players. And I think we are getting a little bit of midnight tides, but like, I like seeing the perspective from like flea bottom. Uh huh. You know what I mean? I, I like when Tyrion goes into the brothel and he's talking to the prostitutes and, and, and that kind of thing. And I know that there's stuff like that in it. But what I'm t- saying is like non-military political conflicts. Uh-huh. I would like to see something that's out of that that maybe gets pushed in. And I haven't got that yet, but that's not what this is at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to call it like mi- military fantasy. Yes. Um, and the the soldiers, the grunts, you know, the the fiddlers of the world they're us you know they're the every people the every man you know characters in here and i think they're the ones that you know they're so often in these epic you know surroundings with these crazy people like animator rake you know and out and brood and these like dude godlike beings that you know they somehow have to hang with um, and so I, I feel like the, 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 the soldiers, the grunts, they're, they're yeah. us. They're, they're the ones that we identify with. They're the yeah. hobbits, you know, in Middle Earth, you know? Yes. Like, you know what I mean? Yes, I totally agree with that. And there was a piece in, I think it was Dead House Gates or maybe it was Memories of Ice, but we actually kind of got an insight that like, because there's a lot of magic in Malaz and I'm mean, obviously right. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, it and really it's almost considered like a myth to normal people. I think someone's talking to Kalam and, and Kalam has to like remind himself that not everybody sees this every day. And I really like that little piece because for me, that's the question I'm asking. I'm saying is the baker down the street, you know, do they know that there's warns and all this? Cr- and apparently not. Apparently it is a lot of hearsay and they don't see the war front usually. Right. Right. That's um, correct. Yeah. And 
and I like that. I like those little bit of details. It's one of the things Robin Hobb does really well. And I love whenever Fitz and Farseer is getting his his world knowledge because he's growing up. He's six. He's getting it from the ladies who are gossiping in the kitchen. And I love that. Um, I just love that those little town building things. Stephen King also does an excellent job of doing stuff like that. And it's something I, I kind of hope I see from Erickson, but I'm not. I'm not I won't be shocked if I don't. And I don't really knock a lot of points. It's just that's my personal flavor. Yeah. that I like to see the opposite end of that spectrum a little bit. Yeah. But you're right. The grunts are us. They are the the small people, the little people, as Joe Abercrombie calls them. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And, you know what Abercrombie does with them? Usually they, they appear in these tiny little scenes in the middle of a battle, and you know they're not going to last very long. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, and on top of that, you know, it's also really interesting that Joe Abercrombie, the consequences of all these elitist actions are then shown through those little people chapters. And you have people, you know, they're dying for what they think is a cause, but we know what actually went behind to get this, these actions in motion. And it's really, really sad. Yeah. Uh, and some of them, you can tell they don't even know why they're fighting. You know, it's just like they just joined the 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 yelling crowd and get dove in. And I think Erickson does that a lot too. It's just like people are um, spokes in a wheel and more. Yeah, there can be a sense of that because you know this is not a spoiler. Uh, Malazan Empire is an empire, and guess what empires do? Uh, they chew up people and they spit them out. And yep you get a lot of that sort of thing where people are cogs in a wheel and, and it can be a very um, depressing thing. And you can, you could start seeing the world in a very cynical way when that is the, the dominant thing that yeah. there's this big entity and it doesn't really matter what you do. You're going to get ground up in it one way or the other. And it's tempting to, to feel just so false every time. <laughs> I laugh. That's pretty good. We are completely dressed. Yes. Uh, we, we don't want any strikes against Jimmy's channel. Here, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I got the tweet on. I mean, yeah. tweet is better than, than uh, gun Certainly. Today, right? So, Certainly. So yeah, I, I think there, there is an extent to which that message is so strong in the Molassen series, but yet the counter message of, and, and people talk about this all the time, but the counter message of compassion. That's why it's so important, I think, in the series. Mm -hmm. Because you can have a, you know certain characters, which you know, um, again, I can't do spoilers here, but they give in to the machine. They do the easy thing. They obey orders. And the consequences are usually ugly. You know? yeah. and, and then there are characters who break out of that and do the compassionate thing. And there are these beautiful moments of connection as a result of that action. And that for me, those are some of those beautiful moments. I can't name a series that has made me cry more times than Malazan. Uh, Wait till and, you finish Realm of the Elderlings. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm oh sure. my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but I know what you're saying. I mean, I mean, the, the, those moments actually sneak up on you. And, and I have in my notes for my review that I'll eventually <laughs> do when I get the Midnight Tides finally yeah. um, that that I said, oh, it kind of snuck up on me. Like I didn't I actually was not a huge fan of this one storyline and there's death. And I'm just like, oh, right. wow, that's right. that's pretty impactful. Erickson, uh, man, he can change your mind in a sentence. It's it's very impressive. Oh, it's it's brilliant. Yeah, it's yeah. brilliant. And they, he just captures the complexity of of, of human beings so well. And uh, Hop does that too, and in, in, I think in a slightly different way. Um, but you know, th there's so many great writers in our genre. You know, and, there are. and uh, it's just a wealth of of great authors who understand humanity. We were talking about Joe Abercrombie. You know, and I think Mark Lawrence is like that. And, N.K. Jemison and, and so many, Ursula Le Guin. And, and, yeah, I just think there's so many great authors who get, and that maybe is the heart of, you know, why we read. It's just, and and yeah, fantasy yeah. so great for it because we can do all of this in another realm, in a faraway place, and, and we, we can, uh, we have the advantage of not, of being safe in our beds, in my case, where I read, you know, I'm lying down in Unless my bed. Unless if you get tired and you drop the book on your head. <laughs> And that's the that's the peril, I guess, of, of uh, yeah, in my case, the peril of having a book thunk me in the forehead. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 
other than that, I'm pretty safe usually when I read. <laughs> um, but I'm in that world with these characters and uh, going through vicariously the dangers that they're facing and, and the issues they're they're going through. And and I I think it helps me get through my own life. You know. Oh well, yeah, I've I've said this before, and I know it it sounds weird, but I think Realm of the Elderlings taught me a lot about myself. Um, especially when talking about grief and guilt and, and things and how relationships, uh, with people that you love, you know, you mess up 20 years ago and you lay in bed at night and thinking about it, you know, it's just, uh, Hob inspects that to a very intimate, um, yeah. you know, level. And, and it, it stuck with me very much, especially that, oh man, the last trilogy, I, I would be very excited to talk to you or AP about, oh yeah. It's going to happen. It's gonna oh happen. my God. That's like my dream, man. <laughs> oh, I love Quad this man. question. Quad yeah, I love it. Yeah, what a yeah. brilliant question. He says, uh, Philip, let me read it just so for the audio only yep. people. Uh, Phil, uh, Quadman 1978 says, Philip, if you could make one or take one character from First Law and put them in Malazan, who would it be? Wow. I mean, I'm not going to do anything original with the answer here, uh, probably. I mean, the, the first thing my mind leaps to, would I'd love to see what Steven Erickson does with Logan Nine Fingers or, or with Glockta, uh, either one. I love Rika in the, the, uh, in the, uh, the latest trilogy in Age of Madness, mm -hmm. so that would be awesome as well. Also, I think Savine would be a great one. Um, there's so many, I mean, I'm going to name all the characters here. Uh, Erickson had did a funny, just, uh, since you brought up the two, uh, Erickson did a funny thing where he wrote a, do you, do you remember Jimmy, how Erickson did a, a, a novella? Uh, it, his novellas are all in the Boca Lane Corbel Brooch, uh, collections. Um, and he did one where he was, uh, a character based on AP. Um, so actually the AP appears in. The, Wait, what? You didn't know this? No, oh, it is so great. You have to read the novellas uh, because he, Steven Erickson based a character named Apto Canavalian on AP Canavan. Uh, and it is so, so, so funny uh, to, to read these stories. But he also did a Bokalin and Corbel Brooch novella uh, where there's a character based on Joe Abercrombie. Um, and he, yeah, uh, he wrote this one though on, um, he wrote it by hand and published it like page by page on his Facebook. So, uh, you'd have to go to his Facebook to read the one where he makes fun of Joe Abercrombie, but yeah. So that's amazing. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the Bokalane and Carble Brooch novellas, there are six of them published and they're collected in two volumes. Uh, so hello in beautiful Hawaii. Wow. Yes. Jealous. Jealous. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, yes, thank you, Abercrass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is so funny. Yeah, the Erickson's a, he's a great guy. He, he will, uh, you know, if you uh, be careful, you might find yourself in, uh, you know, one of his uh, novellas someday. So yeah, uh, but yeah, so he, he has made fun of Abercrombie there as well. That's so, great. Yeah, yeah, people are saying they Glotka me would take over the and so, someone uh, Benjamin Probably. said we're in a Bly is a Malazang. I, I actually agree with oh, that. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Someone asked, "What about Realm of the?" It's the Fool, because the Fool is the best character in fantasy. Yeah, I love yeah. the Fool. Oh my god, the Fool is 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 wonderful. Yeah, and I haven't even read all the books yet. Um, but oh, just just wait. <laughs> no question. Just drop in to say thanks to both y'all for a great time. No problem. Um, it's our you. pleasure. Yeah, thanks for thank being you. here. Thanks I for coming it. by. Yeah. Um. Somebody said, "Oh no, I got to that." Um. So we're talking about how Erickson does a lot of things that people in literature do and, uh, you know, outside yeah. of fantasy and stuff. One yeah. and someone said this earlier and I can't remember who it was, but um, I agree with what they said. And they said that the Prince of nothing by R Scott Baker is very similar to Malazan in a lot of ways. Yeah. I think people who found the frustration of the narrative structure and gardens of the moon, uh, but liked the depth and uh, the themes that were being explored, I think could find a home with our scott baker in my opinion uh philip you have not read him yet right now yeah i have the darkness that comes before and i've, I've mentioned it in like three tbr videos <laughs> <laughs> um, and i do seasonal tbr videos so it's i know i'm embarrassed um but i will read it because i really really want to and uh, everybody who has talked about it with me um i've gotten excited about it because i feel like it's a book that i would really like uh, based I on what people have said you would very much enjoy book one is all about the the leading up to a war basically there is almost i mean there's action but i mean that's what that book is so i think a lot of people will get to the point where they 
maybe they close book one. And I said, ah, oh, like, oh, not a lot happened. But then when you start thinking about all everything that you've learned, it is yeah. incredible. I think it's some of the best political intrigue I, I've read, um, even though I don't think it's like obtuse. Like it's, it's not super convoluted, but it's just really smooth. And uh, I have a lot of respect for Baker. And I think people who are fans of Steven Erickson should absolutely check out that book uh, in that series, Prince of Nothing and everything that comes after that. Uh, I hope to read book two in the next two months or so. Cool. Um, I'm first time in my life. I I'm in the middle of a bunch of series. I don't usually do this, uh, but my Patreon random book thing is is definitely <laughs> has definitely uh, put a spoke uh, or put a stick in my wheels rather. Um, <laughs> but I'm telling you, I really think you like R. Scott Baker. I was very impressed. Different than I expected to. Uh -huh. um, I think a lot of times whenever people talk about Grim Dark, you know, they talk about R. Scott Baker. I never felt like I was being manipulated for being manipulated with the grimness uh -huh. of the book i actually I actually didn't find it to be all that grim to be honest with you really? um okay. I, i've heard it i've heard it gets way worse <laughs> then there are definitely things that are cruel however i think baker does a great job of executing and it yeah. never felt like he was trying to get me to go <gasps> you know it, it never felt like that it felt like a natural reaction to what was unfolding in front of me and ba Baker's just an excellent writer, just an absolute excellent writer. And I'm seeing people say the yeah. book two is full of bonkers. I mean, I can't wait. Full to of bonkers. <laughs> yeah. Mark, yeah. yeah, the political yeah. intrigue in the darks that comes before is amazing. I'm on Aspect Emperor now. Book one of the judging eye is my favorite so far. That's awesome to hear because I don't know too many people who have read the second trilogy or, or if it's a quartet. I can't remember, but the future books after Prince of Nothing. Um I'm telling you, I, I, I think Philip specifically you, I think you're going to have a blast with that. Um, yeah. I'll probably put out a review for that in the next like three or four weeks. So cool. Yeah. I'd yeah. like to see that. It's uh, just make uh, sure there's a, a non-spoiler section for me. Though. Yeah, it'll be non spoiler It's actually going to be fully non-spoiler. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, and another great thing, by the way, about Prince of Nothing is it does one of my favorite things and it has a recap at the beginning of each book. <laughs> that's why. Oh, wow. That's why it actually got slid down the TBR a little bit because I have some other stuff I got to wrap up um, before yeah. I get to it. And I'm like, well, at least it gives me a recap. So, you know, it gets it gets mega points for that. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Wow. Yeah, that's there. Another one I need to read is Gene Wolf, Book of the New Sun. I have that as well. Uh, yeah. That is one I really, really want to read because it's another one that people say I would like, and I, I believe they're probably right. Um, so uh, we'll see. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm probably going to get to both of them next year at some point. That, nice. That's the goal. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah I'm, def I'm definitely but, interested in the Book of the New Sun. Uh, that's something yeah. I'll probably tackle at some point next year. It's also on my patron wheel, so I might. <laughs> Ooh, you might, might end up reading it this month. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, you know what else I got to finish? And I know you're a huge fan of uh, this guy is I got to finish my Tolkien reread for the oh, trilogy, yeah. man. I, uh, you know, the Andy circus books, uh, audio books came out and I'm like, well, I was waiting to finish it because of that. And now it's out. So I don't have any, any excuses. So I think in December, I'm going to do return of the King. Oh, nice. Um, and I made a, I did a, I did a bad thing. I, I actually started with the trilogy and then realized I wanted to go through all Tolkien's works. So now I got to do the Hobbit after the trilogy, which is just, am I even a real Tolkien fan? If I did that, it is what it is, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, you've probably read it before anyway. So, I mean, I guess it's okay, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've read the Hobbit and I've read the trilogy and I'm actually going to continue on though. I'm going to read the Cimmerillion, which I've read some parts, but I've never read from cover to cover. Okay. Yeah. And then I'm going to do like uh, children of Huron, uh, the fall of Gondolin, um and what's the other one help me out i mean there's a lot of them but um yeah i mean a lot of that stuff is actually covered in the silmarillion and then they made tolkien he he made different drafts of different stories over the years and his son christopher tolkien worked them up and published it. that's what the silmarillion is itself actually it wasn't just tolkien it was it was christopher tolkien his son and actually guy gavriel k helped him to kind of whip up i've heard that before yeah yeah to help him edit the uh the what you and i know as the silmarillion but it, tolkien didn't intend for the silmarillion to be something that would be smooth and, and published and it is it's actually a bunch of fragments of, of it's it's different stories essentially i've heard it compared to the bible quite a bit I kind of yeah i mean especially yeah. the earlier stuff there is a creation story in there um but yes uh, but uh, it is not uh, it's not one 
story all the way through. It's, it's, you know, creation and then first age stuff and second age stuff, which I guess they're, the TV show they're doing is second age stuff, right? And Yeah, they, there's a lot of crazy stuff that happens in that, apparently. I've watched a lot of videos about Cimmerillion uh, from Men of the West and all these amazing channels that we have. Um, yeah. So I feel like I, I've, I know a lot of the content. I just haven't read it and I need to, I, I got to read it. Yeah. You know? So you, you would read the Silmarillion and then you would already know children of Hurin because that there, there's a version of that in the Silmarillion. I see. And so the other stuff that's been published posthumously after Tolkien, you know, passed on and, and has been edited up by his son. Uh, I don't know how much of that is Tolkien, how much of it is Christopher Tolkien. And, and um, I, 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 I'm not sure how Tolkien would have felt about all this stuff being published. Um, Interesting. You know, it, it's an interesting thing because I'm a huge Tolkien fan and I love his stuff. And there are the, all the unfinished tales and all this stuff. He didn't have a chance to work it up into uh, what he, I don't think he would have regarded as something to be published. There were just stuff that he tweaked and tweaked and had different versions of all these stories over the years. He was yeah. a, a tweaker. He, you know, he loved to you know, fiddle around with this stuff. Um, so yeah. Maybe he'd be surprised that all this stuff is being published nowadays. I don't know. He'd see those royalty checks and be like, let's do it. Yeah, there is that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that I think that's interesting because I've actually hadn't heard that. Um, I mean, I knew it, they had been edited up by his son and I knew Gar Guy Gabriel K had worked on the uh, Silmarillion. Yeah. Yes. I, I didn't know which book it was, but then it's Silmarillion. So that, that's, that's actually interesting. So maybe, I do want to do the Cimmerillion. I definitely want to do that. So, yeah. but maybe I'll save like Children of Huron and stuff like that for a, a later time because there's yeah. they're not that long, but there's a lot, there's a lot to read with when it comes to the Tolkien universe. Yeah, and you um, would know Children of Huron, like I said, if you read the Cimmerillion, you, you get a shorter version of it right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that I think I'll probably do Return of the King, and then I'll read Hobbit and Cimmerillion. Maybe I might even it, it, those are my Christmas reads, man. I don't know why I default to Lord of the Rings in the Christmas season. I just do. I have seasonal reads. I love reading uh, Stephen King in October, even though this October I'm skipping sure. it since I did the whole Dark Tower. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to be reading uh, on, The Only Good Indians, I think is what it's called, by Stephen Graham Jones. Okay. Yeah, it's supposed to be really good. I'm going to be buddy reading that with Rhythma. Nice. Really, really, really excited about that. I cool. love buddy reading with her. Um, there's a series that AP brought up, and I believe you two are going to read it, and I'm going to read it next year. And I wanted to talk about it here on the stream because I feel like it's not, and I haven't even read it. I actually have book one. I ordered, I read the first chapter and thought it was awesome. Um, and that's Wars of Light and Shadow by uh, Janie Worst. Uh huh. Yeah. It's Worst, right? Worst. Yeah. I, I always say Worst. I'm an idiot. Uh, Worst. Mm. And I want to hear your. Like why you want to read it. Am I correct in that, that you and AP were going to read that? Yeah. Well, it, okay. actually AP is the one who was, um, he's, he's read it before and he knows it. Um, and I've never read it. So I want to read it along with him. I hear good things about that author, about Jenny Wirtz. And I, I think she might be another kind of, I'm hoping to find a kind of their Robin Hobb level kind of writer that I really enjoy. Yeah. Um, so We'll see. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, it's an author I've heard about over the years, but I just haven't read yet. Um, there are so many of those. Um, but, so we'll see. I, I, I'm going to start with Daughter of the Empire, though, I think, which is actually co-written with Raymond Feist. Feist. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. who wrote exactly. Magician and, and all of that stuff and the Rift War stuff. Uh, so um, I think that'll be the first Jenny words that I read, uh, but then I, I will probably want to read uh, some of her own series as well. Yeah, yeah. I've I've actually really wanted to read uh, the Daughter of the Empire, which that book won, and and, uh, and I see people going off about how much they love the Empire series. But that's uh, that's one Petrick actually read, reviewed, gave five stars, and he told me he's like, you should read this. You would yeah. love this. Yeah. And Petrick's very good at identifying things that I would like. So wow. maybe I will also be doing the Raymond Feist trilogy because that'd be a little bit of an easier introduction than diving into an eleven book series. But yeah. I feel pretty confident I'm going to give it a shot. Now I might read it and you know, disclaimer, I might, I might not like it. So who, who knows, but I think I'm going to be really giving uh wars of light and shadow a, a legit shot. I've heard it compared to Malazan on this, um, yeah. the, the depth and the, you know, how confusing it can be. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard that as well. Yeah. 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 Yep. And I like those challenges. Uh, sometimes I got to be in the mood for them, but 
uh, I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I'm excited that other people will be reading it at the same time. And I think there's another channel doing like a read along for that next year. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah. So she's definitely gaining some momentum and I've heard she's a wonderful lady to talk to. And I think she, that too. Yeah. she have her own channel. I think she might have her own channel. That I don't know. I, I actually I hadn't heard that before. Uh-huh. Eddie says we will love it. I believe it. Cool. Somebody was asking about uh, if you have you read Dresden. I'm I'm on the, the fourth book of Dresden Files. I'm uh, trying to find it. I think it's uh, a little up. Yeah. But wow. uh, yeah, I do. I, uh, they're asking if you had read it, and, and I'm going to continue with it for sure. In fact. I have a uh, summer night ready to go and it's either my right now I'm actually reading a uh, Discworld book by Terry Pratchett. Uh, Love to see it. Something I'm going to talk about with Alan um, guards guards. So that's going to be fun. Nice. And cause I've only read two before the first two uh, color of magic and whatever the second one is, I forget. Um, light something light, fantastic. Maybe uh, the, I've only read the first. That's right. Um, so I'm so, so looking forward to talking about, there he is. I'm so looking forward to talking about guards, guards with Alan. That's going to be a lot of fun. I'm actually in the middle of it now. And then my next book after that is probably going to be summer night. Um, if not, I'll read another Ian Esselmont book and then summer night. Nice. uh, Nice. So Uh, have you read Dresden yet? So I have not read Dresden at all. Um, I have the first book. And I, I have a, I actually have the audio book for it too. Cause I've heard it's, it's really good, but um, I haven't had Dresden yet. It's so to be completely transparent, the urban detective fantasy, not yeah. my bag. It's not my bag. It's, it's just not something that I'm, yeah. it's not something I'm jumping to, to get to. However, I know enough people that I trust their opinions and they say that they think I'll really like it. And I think I will. I think it's just one of those things that I just got to do it uh, and yeah. jump in and I would enjoy it. So uh, I'm definitely going to read it. It's, possible that i could get to it in 2022 um especially since they're quicker reads you know i can kind of just go through it yeah that's the nice thing about them is well the first three anyway have been that uh you know that detective noir thing yeah it's it's a different it's a different thing i actually enjoyed uh and a lot of people talk to them about them as you know i hope it doesn't sound insulting but a lot of people do like them as palate cleansers you know and and if you're reading a lot of epic fantasy that change to an urban fantasy, the kind of spoof of detective noir is, is kind of fun. Um, so I enjoyed them for that. But I am told by fans that the Dresden Files gets more epic as it goes along. And so you can read the first That's few heard. and they feel kind of like standalones and you know episodes. But then it gets more and more connected and, and more and more epic and more fantasy like, although it, it, there's plenty of fantasy in, in, even in the, the first three books as well. But so that's what I hear. So I'm really looking forward to kind of getting deeper into that world, you know. Yeah, and Butcher obviously grows as an author over them from what I've heard. And I, I'm really interested in his Codex Alara series, if I'm being completely honest. Like, I think uh-huh. it sounds more appealing than Dresden. Yeah, uh, but Butcher I'm is still going. a big fantasy, right? Yeah, Yeah, and I definitely will um, read Dresden at some point for sure. Um, and Guards, Guards, funny you bring it up because Jake uh, Bishop is reading in October. And if I can, whenever he goes to read it, if I'm available, I might read Guards, Guards as well. Oh, so cool. Nice. It's like, <laughs> it, there must be something in the air in October. I don't know what it is, but yeah, um, Pratchett is awesome. just so good. I read Mort. It's the only book I've ever read by Pratchett, and I just loved it so much. I, I want mean, to read Mort. Yeah, that's a, that's a, the death books. Yeah. Yes. It, it, I mean, I just thought it was so charming. Uh, there's no other word for it. I just thought it was charming, and, and I absolutely adored it. And again, those books aren't terribly long, so it's it feels yeah. almost like a relief to crack open a three or four page book. You yeah. Know? And I feel like if anybody, if you like Monty Python, you're probably going to love Discworld. You know, it's a similar kind of humor. At least that's how I feel anyway. Um, Even Joe Abercrombie in a lot of ways reminds me a little bit of what I read in Mort. Uh, it's not as grim, I would say, but like just that yeah. tongue in cheek, you know, very witty banter. Right. Um, some of those comebacks <laughs> uh, in, in Pratchett's work is so they're so funny. Yeah. Um, Facel, nice, change of pace. nice change of pace. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Fasale wants to know if we ever read Berserk. I am not uh, super into manga. The only one I'm I'm really interested in is Attack on Titan, um, which yeah. I've only watched the show to a certain point, and I'm waiting for them to release like a big collector's box, and I'm going to read through the uh, 
the manga, manga, whatever. I see. I, I try to stay away from because I say things wrong. People get really mad. They're a passionate bunch. Those those people. Berserk interests me. I actually downloaded a sample of it, though, and I didn't really enjoy what I read, if I'm being completely honest. Um, I know it gets a lot better, but it was just one of those things. I downloaded a sample didn't grab me and I just didn't read any more. Philip, do you read any uh, manga? I have not yet. And I would I'm, I'm totally open to trying manga. And I have been told I've been given some good recommendations. I think there's one called Vinland Saga or something. Yes, uh, that's the one Alan told me to read. And I've actually heard other people recommend that as well. Yeah. So I might start with that because I do like my Vikings. Um, Let's and, do oh, it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You want to do it together? Why not? I would love that, dude. I would love to, because I know we do our, we do our Gwen stuff and we do these and I I love all this, but I would love to read something alongside of you. That'd be great. That'd be fun. That would be a blast. And it would be both of us just noobs, just going in. Just the manga noobs. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I I can, I can see the comments now you sold out. You did. (laughs) Yeah, no, I think it would be fun. I've had a lot of people ask me over the, the lifetime of the channel that, it, are you going to try manga? So there we go. There's an endorsement for you. Yeah. Right? And I, I, I always trust Lost and Discovery's opinion about pretty much everything. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So we'll have to do that, Jimmy. Looks like we're committed now. We, hey. we said it in front of, I don't know how many people are left here, but we said it in front of a bunch of people. So uh, yeah. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I think doing something like that as a buddy, it would force me to actually get into the medium and give it a shot. So the beauty of buddy reads, right? It really is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, you know, Rid hit me up. It was like, Hey, I want to buddy read something with you. And it's like October. And she's like, you want to do something spooky? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Let's do, you know, yeah. only good Indians. I have it on my shelf. Cause it was like a 50% off on Barnes and Noble grabbed it. And now I have an excuse to read it. I love when people give me an excuse to read things I bought. <laughs> Cause I end up just buying other stuff. <laughs> I actually redid my shelves for everybody. Uh, I got a middle shelf here now. It used to just wow. be the two talls. Yeah. So right here where my finger is, this is weird. I'm moving backwards. These are the Folio Society Game of Thrones edition. It's split in the Whoa. two. And then these are all the uh, illustrated. And then down here, I got a bunch of uh, Dark Tower first editions that I've been finding from, I think, Viking Press, I think. Sweet. Oh, no. Yeah, wow. but I changed my setup. I have 33 Stephen King books. <laughs> I'm not allowed to buy any more Stephen King, guys. <laughs> I have three copies of Wizard and Glass. <laughs> or no, I'm sorry. How many Wizarding books has the dude written? Like 80 or something, right? So many, and there's only a few good ones. You know, no, I'm just kidding. I love King. <laughs> He's too easy to dunk on, you know what I mean? He's just... <laughs> Yeah. How do you write that many books? How old is he even? That's like a book a year since he was like one year old. I think he's in his seven. Is he early seventies now? He's getting up there. Yeah. yeah. He's getting up there and he's still very, uh, you know, he's still, he speaks well. I see him talk about things and he pushes movies uh, on his Twitter and stuff. And he, he, he's very uh, coherent. So I hope he keeps writing books for many, many years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, bless him. He's, he's done. Mark says, oh. manga, manga <laughs> and comics, so I'm going to cover comics. <laughs> I used to read comics when I was American, you know, comic books, mostly Marvel, but some DC when I was a kid, you know, I had a pretty okay collection of comics. I have never been into comics. Uh, I don't look, you know, some people say that in a snobby way or they look down. It's not that it's just not my thing. I've just never really, I like Spider-Man. Spider-Man is pretty dope. Um, that's about it. Like uh, I just something I've tried to watch the movies and stuff and get into it. And I just, I don't know. Just not. I, w- I wish it was because there's so much content. The movies are so good, and it's just like just not for me, you know. Yeah. I love that, Alan. Uh, I would actually pay money to watch you wrestle, Jimmy, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. we could do a booktube uh, wrestling charity event, <laughs> dude. Alan would be a phenomenal pro wrestler. I mean, I don't know about in the ring, but like character wise, and it's way to see six foot six though. Yeah. Oh yeah, you got to be two forty six six. So. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe he is. I don't know. I, is, that's the funny thing about uh, BookTube. We don't know how tall we all are, right? So. I am six one. I, there's been a, like Daniel Green apparently six foot tall or something, and that surprised me because I thought he would be very short. I thought he would be yeah, like maybe eight, like five. He's short guy energy, you know. I'm, just, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh dear, but you should. I'm, I'm going to read Long Price Quartet. Alan's got me to. to when are you going to read it, Philip? I am reading it starting in November, late November. I'm going to read the first one. And I'm actually going to be, we've got a group of people um, 
who are going to be reading it together. So uh, I think it's starting late November and then December and January, February. I think we can do oh, one of them. I kind of want to do it. Yeah. <sighs> Maybe. I, I hear great things. Oh, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a series that, of course, Alan has been trying to convince me to read it for a while. And well, I'm a Daniel Abraham stand, man. Like, I love Daniel Abraham. And it's not, it's not so much that I don't want to read it or anything like that. It's just like, I oh, yeah. how do you fit it all in? That's yeah. Funny. Especially, I'm in the middle of The Broken Earth by N.K. Jemison, which I thought fifth season was one of the best books I've ever read. And the Prince of Nothing trilogy. And then I'm obviously reading a, a one Malaz in a, a month and a, one Song of Ice and Fire book a month. And then I have a random Patreon book I got to read every month, you know. Wow. Yeah, I'm trying. And I'm six reviews in, in the hole. So I got I to gotta record tomorrow. Tomorrow is for the for the recording for sure. <sighs> Yeah, I'm, wow. I'm not complaining by the I, I like this, so I, it might sound like I'm yeah. complaining. I'm not. I mean, these are good problems that yes. we have here. These are yes. good problems. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Okay. Good, Mark. I was a Marvel guy too. X Men was my thing. Always the X Men and Spider Man. Yes, absolutely. I love the X Men, especially Nightcrawler. People, man, favorite. people love that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like the banner, Jimmy. It looks great, by the way. Your books look fantastic. Thank you. I'm actually working uh, on some very primitive stages, but I'm really hoping to get some signage for chatting with nuts and do a more. I usually, I've been sitting on the couch, actually, Philip. I don't know if you saw the other episode. I was sitting on the couch, but uh, the couch makes me sweat a lot for some reason. It, the, the material, not good for the long conversation. Uh, so I'm kind of looking to do a more permanent setup with some signage and maybe getting uh, a new camera. I'm, I'm working on some things. You're going to get fancy on us now. Yes. Huh? I like going down rabbit holes. Tech rabbit holes are my, my arch nemesis. <laughs> um, I've always been a nerd in that regard. And uh, yeah, it hasn't changed since I've gotten older at all. Uh, somebody said, where is it? Oh, here it is. Amanda, one of my wonderful patrons and a avid Rainwild Chronicles defender, says, will this get me a ticket to the wrestling match between me and Alan? Uh, it, in fact, will, Amanda, but I would have let you in for free because you're wonderful. So <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy started a holy war beat. No, no, never, never. You crushed me. Uh, Jimmy, try to start, try stuff outside of superhero comics and see if you'd like them. Saga. Providence, East of West, uh, Meta Barons, Middle West, etc. All you know what I am very interested in, and maybe somebody here can tell me more about it. Is and Philip, have you seen the show that came out on FX? Um, it is called, I think it's called X or Y. It's like the Last Man Alive. I am the last person to ever watch a show. I, I don't have it. Well, it's based on a comic, so I didn't know maybe if you had read. Oh, the comic. okay, yeah. So no, I, I don't have like television. Uh, so um, <laughs> I don't have cable either. <laughs> I'm the guy who still like rents the uh, DVDs from the library like five years after the show has been you know watched by everyone else in the world. That so. doesn't surprise me, Philip. I don't know why. I think well, it's a jacket. It's a tweet. <laughs> it's yeah. a jacket. <laughs> yes it's called why the last man ah. i thought the premise sounded so fascinating i don't know if the ah. show's any good but i, I actually kind of wanted to read those i actually kind of wanted to, to read those comics huh. they sound very interesting and so yeah, it looks like people they're like based that. on uh a comic series is that yeah it's based on a comic series and this dude's like the last guy in the world Oh, that sounds depressing and he has to repopulate the you know it you know it's that's the uh the by himself well there's all all types of women oh oh he's, he's oh. literally the last man on earth he's the last male okay male gotcha. yes yeah huh. so i thought i just thought that sounds pretty interesting yeah um, and i've heard he does a phenomenal job with it i've heard he's done huh. like uh, people regard that i've heard a lot of people say it's like their favorite uh comic series huh. um I don't know it. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure because you said you like comics. So I when I this was in the seventies and the eighties. So it's been a little while. Um, You're dating yourself. Yes, I am. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I collected comics from the late seventies until probably around eighty five or so. So really classic stuff. Yeah. I mean, you also uh, saw Star Wars in theaters. I did in nineteen seventy seven. Yeah. That's how I it's how I remember that you are a little yeah. older because I always think of you as like young. I just do. And oh. I'm like, I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> Philip, saw, <laughs> Philip saw, saw Star Wars in theaters. That's insane. That's a nice way of saying that I, I haven't grown up. So yeah. <laughs> no, no, never, never. Yeah. Never. 
Oh, so you just bought it, Mark? I mean, I I mean, I don't want to commit to that anytime soon, but like if it were later, like maybe early next year, I I mean, I'd probably be down to try it. I don't know if I'd like it, but I'd definitely give it a shot because I've I've actually had it recommended to me a couple of times. Um, someone's recommending the Gap series by Stephen R. Donaldson. Donaldson yeah. I want to read Donaldson so bad. I want to read the Thomas Covenant series next year. Uh, yep. They're short. They're you know supposedly phenomenal and pose a lot of questions about morality. And yep. I've heard it's just very deep and very dark. And I know that Erickson was a fan of him. And I know that Donaldson yep. has given endorsements on Malazan, but I, I think it's on yep. this one. Yeah, I think it's on this one. Um, so the fact that Donaldson and him are so tightly knit kind of makes yep. me interested yep. to read. So, yeah, I've read Lord Fowl's Bane, um, uh, and that was a long time ago. And I also do want to reread it and, and read the series. I think, again, Mark, I think, has read some Donaldson, I think. Um, yeah, Mark is the king of Grim Grimdark. There's no doubt yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's the Grimdark guru. Mark. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I uh, I started out reading mostly Grimdark because I like the Song of Ice and Fire, and I wanted to see how deep huh. the rabbit hole went. But I've, I've come to the conclusion, and I, and I do like Grimdark, you know, whatever that marketing name they put it on on it i find that it's not so much in that i like just grimdark it's that i like series with realistic consequences to things yeah uh, i'm not looking to be grossed out right you know i'm not saying i don't want gross stuff like i'm okay with it but i have now read some things where i feel like they're trying to get a reaction out of me instead of earning it yeah you know what i mean yeah i i think that's i mean <laughs> I'm sure there's just a, for every person there's a different definition of grimdark, but you know for me, people who've accepted that label, who I I have read like Mark Lawrence for example, yeah, um, and I would argue that only his very first trilogy is really grimdark. Um, I actually have it sitting over here. Broken Empire is is grimdark, but the rest of his stuff less so. Uh, but anyway, whatever you call it, I think the, the people that I've read, yep, there you go. I, I love that trilogy. I know a lot of people can't stand the protagonist, but I think it's brilliant stuff. But anyway, yeah, I, I just think that Grimdark is not, um, it's not splatter, for, you know, it's not uh, just nihilism. It's not what I think a lot of people think of when they hear the term. To me, it's more like existentialist, which is to say Grimdark is not, Okay, so the idea that the universe has no intrinsic meaning, right? Mm -hmm. But, and, I mean, and if we're going to go nihilism, the universe has no meaning and anything you do doesn't, nothing matters. Like whatever you do doesn't matter. That's nihilism. That's not what grimdark is to me. To me, the best grimdark is, yeah, maybe the universe doesn't have intrinsic meaning, but what you do matters. You can create meaning by, yeah, well, by, you know, just going out in the world and, you know, facing what you got to face and, and doing what you got to do. And, and so I think there's a, there's a, a, a ray of hope in that, that I think exists. Like you don't, you don't give up, you keep trying. And that's a, I think that's a common element in grimdark. But. Yeah. And, and I consider myself a nihilist for the most part. And there is active nihilism where uh -huh. um, you don't actually like, just like you create the arbitrary value. Like that can be very freeing for somebody. Um, you yeah. know, nihilism in its general sense back in the day used to just be like kind of what you said. And then it's like, well, why get out of bed in the morning? Um, but <laughs> not actually my doctor said that to me. I think I told the story maybe, maybe on my last time. I can't remember, but huh. she was just like, why get out of bed in the morning? I said, because I want to. And she said, but why? It doesn't matter. And I said, because I'm a selfish human and I like endorphins blasting in my brain. So I get up and do things that give me the, that rush. Yeah. And she's just like, but you see how that falls apart whenever you put it to the test, I'm like, no, I don't see because I know that I get to assign arbitrary value to tasks that I do every day. Like, you know what I mean? Um, I think I, and, but it, I agree with you. I actually don't think that that is core to what is considered grim dark. I don't right. think it's core to that. I don't think a book has to be nihilistic to be grim dark. Okay. Yeah. Um, I agree with you on that. Um, and I always say, if you don't consider Robin Hobb grimdark, then I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah. I Especially mean, the last trilogy. I mean, it's huh. some of the most uncomfortable things I've ever read. Wow. Yeah. But, but at the same time, I think you found a lot of beauty in, in all of that struggle, didn't you? I think there is beauty in struggle. I think that, yeah. um, 
I mean, there's obviously some things that there is no beauty in. I mean, there's no mm-hmm. reason to pretend that every single thing that bad happens in life or in this case in a narrative that is going to have a positive outlook and say, man, I really came out on the better side of that. That, that is not <laughs> true. Yeah, you can be damaged and be permanently damaged, but it's 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 the inspection of those things and, and how you react to them. And, um, sometimes it, it does ruin a character, right? Like we see mm-hmm. go through something and that, that's the, and they're never the same. I can think of like off the top of my head, like a million examples from Robin Hobb or, or George R. R. Martin. Right. But, uh, it, it's the, it's, um, I'm going to use your term here is the unflinching inspection of that, that I appreciate from grim dark. And that's why I say, I really enjoy, um, consequences whether or not the 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 action is good or bad or the person deserves it or doesn't deserve it i like to to feel that i like to see that yeah Um, and i think it kind of helps um deal with things that happen in life well i think that those are the stories that are most compelling aren't they i mean that's why a book that has a happy ending with everybody everything's great you know it doesn't feel convincing right i mean maybe you feel a little happier but then it just doesn't feel quite right. And then there are the books that tear your heart out. And, uh, but there's something that just feels compelling about that, that I I think any triumph has to come with some loss. And maybe that just gets to the heart of, you know, what life is when, you know, that's the nature of life. Um, So, and we come up with ways to to deal with that. Right. Yeah. I tell you what, wisdom of crowds is a very good example. I was thinking of that in my head too. Yeah. I was happy, sad, mad, questioning yep. at the end of Wisdom of Crowds. And I think Age of Madness encompasses what the modern grimdark is. Uh, uh-huh. Now things get dark and I'm not like, you know, things go way darker than, than what Abercrombie did. But I think the spirit oh, yeah. of those books uh, really, really uh, is a good poster child for grimdark. Yeah. But I guess we need to ask Mark because we're not authorities. <laughs> I haven't read Thomas Covenant, so I don't know. I don't know anything. <laughs> yeah, I, I've only read the first book, Lord Kyle's Bane, and it's. Um, I mean, I, I think it's it's right to think of of uh, Donaldson as a precursor to Grimdark. Yeah, I, yeah. I would agree with that from what I've read. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, even Gemmel, a lot of people also give a little bit of a nod to Gemmel because of mm-hmm. the consequences that happen in the hero's journey for him and, and everything wow. else. Oh, hey, I'll hey Gemmel yeah. myself later this uh, probably in the beginning of of 2022. I started Legend and I need to finish it. Um, uh-huh. I picked it up at a time where I should have been picking up a new book. I was in the middle of something big and I just like had a day where I was like, I just need to read something else. And and I started Legend. I liked it. I just need to finish it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Diego. <laughs> yeah. I love you, Diego. Right back at you. <laughs> Grimdark is reality without sugarcoating it. I think that's what I think. When I think of Grimdark, I think of like really inspecting consequences of actions. Um, and uh-huh. especially on the hero's journey, that's always a really good way to go. Um, yeah. Benjamin asked, with no spoilers, Jimmy, did you like the way Gorst was handled? Yes. Oh, my God. And Gorst is my pick for First Law in the Malazan. Oh, yeah. That's mine. I didn't answer the question. I actually meant to. Gorst. Gorst is maybe my favorite character in First Law. Huh. huh. He's the MVP of the heroes. That That is... Dude, I love the Gorst. I can't even say anything because of spoilers, but Gorst is my favorite. And it's funny because he's not even a main character. <laughs> Yeah. He has such a unique voice, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got to read. No spoilers, but yeah, you, you, you'll you'll enjoy Gorst. And How's I, the leg? <laughs> 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 I I I thought he was. I was very happy with his arc as well. Um, oh, I loved it. I think there's no other way to do it. There's no other way to do it. You know. Yep. Yep. Uh, I, I like what Mark says here. He said, Grimdark is tricky considering we all bring something different to the table. And that's that's exactly correct, Mark. Right. Because what's Grimdark to me yeah. and what strikes me as cruel and bleak might not you know, strike somebody else and all of our personal experiences of things that happen to us in our lives. And I think uh, that's probably why some people read Robin Hobb and don't seem to come out of it with the same feelings that I do, where I think it uh-huh. is extraordinarily grim. Uh, there is a sense of hope underneath Robin Hobb, though. That's oh, that yeah. I think is very beautiful. But uh, yeah. that that's a great point by Mark. Yeah, I like seeing that. I like seeing that. The Gorse uh, love is here. Yeah, I love it. Dino says that's why Grimdark is so powerful. One of my favorite analogies is displaying a diamond on black velvet. Huh. Grimdark makes the little good moments so much more powerful, in my opinion. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Or or the stars up in the night sky. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What writer would you like to see let loose in the Malaz world? And what would you like to see them tackle? I don't know. What I would like to see him tackle. Cause I haven't read enough of, I'm only on book five, but I like the idea of Joe Abercrombie. If I'm being honest, because of how distinct his characters are. Yeah. He'd be interesting. Maybe I'm scapegoating. Cause that's what we already talked about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a fun answer. Uh, huh. Who, who could, who would be up for it even, you know, um, I not mean, Germ. cross Germ off the list. <laughs> Yeah, no, there's a different sensibility there, I think, a little bit. Um, but uh, R. Scott Baker would work. R. Scott Baker, maybe. Yeah, I haven't read his stuff yet, but from what I've heard, bro, you're gonna love it. Th there could be a sort of a fit there, or or Donaldson, um, and of course, <clears throat> well, these stuff, these guys were inspirations for for Erickson, right? Like uh, Donaldson, Glenn Cook, Glenn Cook. Um, who, if you've read the Black Company, you know where a lot of that soldier humor and the malaise and stuff comes from. Um, that's a good answer that your brain on books had there, Jemison, N.K. Jemison. That would be cool, actually. I would love to. Yeah, I think that's my favorite answer right there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, so uh, the Baron, his channel is phenomenal, by the way, people. You got to check out his channel. Uh, he's just starting out and just making videos that are probably better than mine. And he's, like huh. the, the, the sky's the limit for Baron, but Baron's book, he's one of my patrons and Baron, uh, put the fifth season by MK Jemison on his pick for the Patreon random pick. And at one, and that's why I started the broken earth. And good. oh my God, it's good. It's brilliant. It's, it's brilliant. Bril yes. It's, it might not be for everybody. Yeah. It's undeniably a unique and amazing entry for the genre. I just think it's incredible. I think she's, she's so good. This season's so good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would just say be open minded when you start it and give it some time. Um, yes, because I, I think most people have heard about the, there's some second person in it, which is unusual. Uh, yes. But uh, it all comes together. It's really something. It's yeah. Really something. Yeah. yeah. The way she she ties it all together is very masterful, in my opinion, for just okay. book one, like just book one alone, I thought was masterful. So yeah, agreed. Uh, people yeah. are picking Guy Gavril K. Huh? Yeah, he would be great. Yeah. Have you read any guy? I, I, I need to read some GGK. I haven't read. I have read Tigana um, and a long time ago, long, long time ago, before many people were born, before you were born, Jake, uh, I read Tigana. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I have not read, and Jake is trying to get me to read, uh, uh, what is it, Jake? Uh, the Lions, Lions of, of all, all Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I will, the way he described it. And I've had, I've had other people recommend it too. I'm so. more interested in that book than I am Tagana. Interesting. I, I highly recommend Tagana. I think it's it's just fantastic. Um, yeah. Everybody talks about Kay's prose and it is really masterful. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's the Lions of Al. Thank you, of Al Rasan. Yeah, I mean, I, I might have come up with that eventually, but yes, thank you. And Anne Sparks is another author. I've never read any Anne Sparks. I haven't either yet. No, nope. I'll be honest with you. I actually am Googling Anne Sparks right now. I feel like I see her on the used bookstore shelf a lot, um, but I, I don't, I don't know any of the books that she's actually written. It looks like there's other people. Na yeah, I, I don't think it's quadruplets for the billionaire. I don't. Unless if this was a joke and uh, I'm falling for it right now, maybe that's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, guy, I'm okay. That. Joke that as Tim said, he made people cry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Anna Smith Sparks. Okay. Oh, Anna Smith Sparks. Okay. Yeah, she wrote. Uh, she has a series. I think it's pretty grim dark. If I'm not, she's, she's been described as grim dark. Yeah. Yeah, Anna Smith Sparks. Yeah, I've 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 heard multiple people either love or hate her. It's like one or the other with her. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I haven't read her yet. I, I would like to try. Yeah. Yeah, that seems to come in the territories of a lot of grim dark authors, though very polarizing because they tend to uh, <laughs> go with some deep themes and events. So yeah. that doesn't surprise me. Yep. Yep. So. All right. Well, we've been at it for almost well, three Jimmy, hours. I, I'm shocked. I, I, how did, how does Alan do it? How do you go for another two hours? How, that would, it would take us two more hours to break his record, right? Yes. <laughs> no, it's a, uh, it'd be an oh. hour and uh, 20 hour and 30 minutes. I don't think I'm going to make it, Jimmy. I don't think <laughs> I can do it. Well, I'm, I, I got to eat dinner. So <laughs> it's all I got to, I got to wake up early tomorrow morning, bring my daughter to her martial arts. So I support uh, this. Yeah. 
I support this we, very we much. You can get behind that, I think. Yeah, but absolutely. this has been a absolutely wonderful time for me and uh i thank everybody who is uh there's uh, alan nobody can compete with you that's just how it is you know so, <laughs> nobody oh, no. can do it i know he's breaking the record so you're so safe you provided an amazing experience for everyone that's listening i mean we've been over 50 people the whole time which is always uh just tremendous and um thank you for all the marvelous conversation man i, I love talking to you Oh, likewise, Jimmy, you're, you're doing a great thing here. And I, I want to thank you for, for myself on a personal level, because I've, I'm having a lot of fun getting to know you. And <laughs> uh, it's just a wonderful thing as well. I think everybody would share the sentiment that what you're doing for all of us by having this series, in, in addition to all the other stuff you do on your channel it's just it's it's become a place I think for a lot of us to to it's like coming to uh, the pub and having your drink with your buddies and, and that sort of thing and so what you're doing for us Jimmy is just such a wonderful thing and I just want to express my gratitude for it so uh, and now I'll be back uh, watching whoever's on next yeah absolutely and I'll have you on again um, absolutely Love you're to. one of the core people here uh with chatting with nuts and, and i'm very uh you know I, I i consider it an honor to to kind of host these things and bring everyone together and that's really what i want you know i i want this to be the pub uh for all of us nerds in the fantasy realm and sci-fi and everything else and and i love even you know even the things i don't necessarily love um you know like yeah. comic books and stuff i love seeing people get excited about it and if i can provide a medium for people to come on and talk about what they're really passionate about then uh yeah. that, that, then i'm happy because that's that's my goal so <laughs> I love Tony's uh, comment there. Our combined channel would be called Chasing Nuts. I mean, I kind of <laughs> love that. I think someone actually even said that earlier, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Wow. Well, and who knows? Maybe we'll do a group read of some uh, manga. Maybe we'll do it. Who knows? Or we'll do a, a WrestleMania thing where we yes. use guns. We should do book two boxing. I'm trying to push it. Uh, <laughs> okay. be great Every, all the other YouTubers are doing it why don't we do it um, why not? I would have a slightly unfair advantage but that's why I want to do it because I like winning so <laughs> all right. uh, excellent well Philip thank you so much chat thank you I will have an October wrap up out on the channel this weekend uh, Philip thank you again for giving your Friday night I appreciate you brother honor and a pleasure thank you Jimmy awesome well next time until I see you guys next time be good be safe and remember to always Keep turning the page.